As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and streamlined on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oaks. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. I see his face. Terry. Can you come back to him? Ms. Dahl. Here. Ms. Mead. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. Ms. Darby. Here. Mr. Holmes. Terry. Yeah. Yeah. We can confirm that he's here through yep. Zoom because we can see him. I've confirmed council members are present. All right, thank you. I ask that city manager Steve Rosenberg note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. We have, um, as you can tell, many participants on the Zoom platform this evening. We have members of council, Brenda Mead, Carolyn Dahl, and Terry Holmes. I myself am participating on the Zoom platform as our assistant city manager, Leslie Beauregard, mm. clerk, clerk of council, mm -hmm. Faith Simmons, interim city attorney, Andrew McRoberts, um, several individuals affiliated with Stanton City Schools are also participating during the work session on the Zoom platform, including Amy Ratchford, uh, Bob Boyle, Natasha McCurdy, and Christine Polson. Uh, we also have some additional city staff members who are participating on Zoom, including James Corbett and Chris Tuttle. Thank you. Including someone's dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members of city council. In addition to limited public seating in city hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel in the city's website. During this work session, as in the past, there will be no opportunity for public comment. Public comment will be received during council's regular meeting, which will begin at 7.30 p.m. Instructions for public comment by telephone can be found on agenda for the regular meeting and on council's website at www.ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city council. Also, let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting, although being conducted in person, is also being conducted by Zoom with virtual participation by certain members of city council, given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID-19 outbreak, which is part of the total circumstances makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the city ordinance 2020-04 regarding continuity of government, a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash COGORD 2020-04, as extended by City Council Ordinance number 2021-04. All right, with that said, I will ask that um, anyone coming into City Council, if you could wear your mask while in the chambers or frankly anywhere in City Council, we would appreciate it. We do offer um, hand sanitizers at the podium. We also offer um, uh, the hand sanitizer wipes at the podium and we offer hand sanitizer at the entrance of um, the chambers. So, and also um, City Council members, if you'll recognize the mayor, the mayor will recognize you in order to speak and just keep order um, during this hybrid meeting. All righty. 
With that, the first item on the agenda is a consideration of work session and regular meeting agendas. Madam. Um, <laughs> Vice Mayor Robertson. Madam Mayor, um, I move to approve the work session agenda and the regular meeting agenda as presented. All right, so we have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Robertson. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Um, Council Member Darby. I second that. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oates. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. The next item is item number two, a joint budget work session and Stanton School Board meeting. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Mayor and members of council. Uh, this item is on council's agenda uh, annually um, as, uh, as an event on the front end of the budget development process uh, that brings the city council and the school board together uh, to discuss general items of mutual interest, um, such as the capital improvement projects or current legislative issues. I understand that uh, the school staff, uh, along with Dr. Smith, um, have prepared uh, a presentation to share with council members. And at this point, I would uh, turn things over to Dr. Smith. Um, and it may be just procedurally that the school board uh, may wish to call itself to order for purposes of the joint session. All right, thank you. Uh, Chairman Kenneth Venable, would you like to call the school board to order? Good evening, Madam Mayor. And Good evening. School board members. At this time, I'd like to call the Stanton City School Board to order. And then also at this time, I would turn it over to uh, Dr. Smith. Okay, Dr. Smith, thank you very much. welcome. And welcome all school board members. We are very happy to be able to have this uh, joint work session with um, all of you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Venable. Good evening, uh, Mayor Oaks and city council members. We're very pleased to be here tonight. Thank you for having us. Um, our goal tonight is to complete this presentation in 30 minutes or less to allow some time for questions. The past few years, it seems like we've run out of time at the end, but Leslie Beauregard graciously offered a 45 minute time slot for us. So. We're going to try to take advantage of that. So I think everybody has a paper copy of the presentation in front of them. And we're starting on uh, the, the, second, uh, the second page entitled Milestones. So you can see a couple of the milestones we wanted to bring to the council's attention here this evening. The Stanton High School project uh, is generally completed, it's on schedule and on budget. There's a couple little things we're still working on there, but we're just, we're just about done. Uh, our school nutrition department has provided more than 383,000 free meals over 10 months, March through December, wow. trying to keep our community and families fed. Our staff had their first round of COVID immunizations at Stanton High School on uh, Monday, February 8th. Our second round is scheduled for March in partnership with uh, Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities, we've started our first ever equity committee. It's a 20 member panel of students, staff and citizens, and they're developing an equity plan and we will present their recommendations to the school board by the end of the year. So we started meeting in December, we'll continue meeting through April. And then after that, we will present the committee's recommendations to the school board. And then finally, uh, we've been named a school division of innovation by the state of Virginia. So in September of 2020, Stanton City Schools was recognized as one of only 15 out of 132 school divisions throughout Virginia to receive the first school divisions of innovation distinction. So this is a new distinction. So these distinctions recognize schools for designing and implementing alternatives to, to traditional instructional practices and school structures that improve student learning and citizenship. SCS was recognized specifically for its work around high quality instruction, authentic learning experiences, and equity and development of an inclusive culture and community. 
So Stanton City Schools maintains ambitious goals to support continued growth in these areas. And we're proud of this distinction that remains in effect for the next three years. Now we are moving on to strategic initiatives. When we think about big picture, what we want our budget to reflect, competitive living wages for all of our employees. And we'll talk about this in greater detail later in the presentation. Our compensation is currently not keeping pace with inflation. Uh, read, as part of uh, being a school division of innovation, one of our goals is to have every student reading on grade level by the end of second grade. We feel like if we can get every student, if we throw all of our resources on getting every student reading on grade level by the end of second grade, that's gonna solve a whole bunch of problems for kids moving forward. So one of the things we have in this budget is to add three instructional assistants for the primary grades at our three elementary schools to free up teachers to do extra, extra uh, reading groups with students. We also want to expand our preschool program. If you remember from last year, we were trying to do this as well before the budget got chopped at the state level. Our ultimate goal is to wipe out our waiting list for all preschool students. For all, any family who has a preschooler that wants to attend our preschool, we wanna be able to accommodate them. So by adding one more class uh, with a teacher and assistant, we will be able to accommodate them. Our ultimate goal is to create an equal number of preschool sections as we have of kindergarten sections. So that would mean we'd essentially have an extra grade. Instead of 13 grades, we'd have 14 grades. We know the research supports that intervening when students are at the youngest age is where you make the greatest impact over time. So we'll continue to really push our preschool expansion. We want to restore our elementary school fine arts program. That would require adding a music and an art teacher. Currently they share two music and art teachers across three schools. The cuts were made 10 years ago. We've heard a lot from the community in our budget survey this season and elsewhere that the arts are very important mm -hmm. and that we need to restore these positions. We've also found a, a very um, useful, a very user-friendly online credit debit card payment system. So families can pay school fees and make spirit store purchases from the high school with credit cards or debit cards rather than having to come into the building. And we think that'll make things a lot easier for families. And um, we want to continue to establish career pathways at the middle school. Also as being a school division of innovation, we're trying to get more students um, with industry credentials coming out of high school. So in our mind, if we get them in middle school, we have a much greater chance of making this happen. Currently, we're in the regional Valley Career and Technical Center, but most of those programs don't begin for students until 11th grade. So we wanna capture the students' interests earlier. So what we have right now, we, we have a dig it path, and in the dig it path, it's, it's a, we have a greenhouse and it's agricultural. And I think you'll see how our pathways kind of fit with the city of Stanton. We have a cook it path, that's our family consumer science. We've got a create it path, that's restaurant and business entrepreneurship. And what we wanna add is a fix it path. And the fix it path would be a great community builder because students would learn basic maintenance in their homes, basic carpentry, basic plumbing and those types of things. So they would be able to maintain their own property. So we think it would really have a great economic benefit for our families. I need so, that class. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> and then we want to consolidate our maintenance and transportation into one facility. Uh, the current working conditions for employees aren't, aren't acceptable. And uh, in order to remove the bottleneck to Shelburne upgrades, because we do want to upgrade Shelburne Middle School, uh, we, need to, we need to get the maintenance department out of the basement at Shelburne where they where they currently operate and they've been operating for 50 years. So we have had our architect do a site study at Shelburne to upgrade and moder modernize indoor and outdoor learning spaces there. And I'm gonna turn it over to Brad Wagner for the numbers part. I get to dig into the really exciting part. Um, so this, this, as you're aware, our primary funding sources for our uh, schools are in the federal government, the state government, and the local government. This first slide I just wanted to start out with, showing a five-year history of our appropriations from the City of Stanton General Fund. Um, and you'll notice in FY21, uh, what we originally approved 
with the onset of the, the COVID and the closing down of schools and uh, big adjustments to, to revenues across the board, we had to take a significant cut in those revenues. Those cuts now proposal is to restore those to where they were in FY20. Um, and the lower chart shows basically the year over year delta um, in those appropriations. So um, in terms of the local funding, what that means is that um, we'd be appropriating $13.85 million from the, the uh, city of Stanton, closing that uh, $1.8 million gap that occurred in FY21. Uh, you also note that in the current budget year, uh, we filled a gap in that in that budget by tapping our education fund reserves for approximately $750,000. That's a last resort um, and is not being presently considered for the for next year. Um, the, the net result is that we would be increasing uh, our, our local funding by about a million dollars. Um, our state funding is driven primarily by enrollment projections. Um, and the actual funding is not really resolved until basically the March of the school year when our official ADM is published and calculated. So um, what you can see going into next year, what we're projecting is uh, no change in our uh, average daily membership. Um, we put a lot of thought into it and the more we thought about it, the more we realized that we were overthinking it. Um, we don't know whether our enrollment is going to accelerate or decelerate. And we could argue both sides of that coin. Um, so what we're proposing in our budget projections here is just to keep it flat with what we projected in this current year and then go from there. Um, you'll also see a significant increase in our summer school uh, enrollment. Uh, that's primarily resulting from our summer school on steroids that we'll be implementing this summer to make up for learning loss that has occurred over the current year. Um, in addition, uh, you'll see expansion. VPI is our uh, the Virginia Preschool Initiative. So that growth is related to the addition of an additional uh, preschool class. And then we also expect along with uh, what we've seen over the last several years is growth within our uh, English as a second language uh, group. Um, so on page seven, you can see our, our current projections for revenue. And I'm gonna say that right, right now that this is a, a projection and it's gonna change. Um, the, the local revenues um, projected at a total of $14.9 million is based principally on the guidance from uh, Mr. Treyer. Um, we've talked about it and he said, let's just start out with uh, level funding from FY20. So that's what we have in our, in our budget. Um, with the state revenue, that's driven by the governor's budget, which, which, re which was released in December. We are still anticipating in the, probably next week, a, a template using the houses budget and then another template with the Senate's budget. And then ultimately towards the end of the month, we expect to see a consolidated budget template for us to calculate what our state revenues could be. And then federal funding in this projection just kept flat from the current year. Now, moving on to slide eight, um, we'll talk about the expenditures. Um, we go through a process in, in the schools where we um, start out with budget requests. This year we had a little bit over 70 individual line item budget requests. Um, and I've tried to break those down into categories that make sense for us to sort of digest all of them. Um, those include raises, um, payroll adjustments, new positions in stipends. So these are additions above and beyond what have already been in prior budgets. Um, restoration of non-compensation budget cuts. These were cuts that were made in from their FY21 budget 
with the onset of the of the COVID effect, if you will. Um, then also um, new non-comp expenditures and increases. So this is new funding that wasn't previously budgeted in prior years. And then a health insurance increase um, that has been um, suggested to us by our insurance brokers. Um, in addition to these uh, requests, we have also um, been able to identify about a half a million dollars in spending cuts deferments in some of these requests, meaning they're not so important or so critical that we cannot wait another year. So we've pushed them out a year. Um, and then it also, in some cases, we've been able to uh, access um, some Federal CARES Act funding to um, make, make sort of our budget numbers. So we can use that funding to, to pay some of our budget requests. Net-net, the total request, I uh, come out to about $3.2 million. And I'm going to let Mr. Dr. Smith talk about. Uh, okay, so we're on slide nine now, general pay raise. We're proposing a 3% general pay raise for employees for a total of $670,000. A 1%, each 1% raise adds about $220,000 in costs, salary, benefit, and payroll taxes uh, for our employees. For our teachers, uh, two years of a step increase equals a 1.81% raise. Each step's about 0.9. So last year, our teachers did not get the monetary step increase. So this two, the 2% the 2 gets them, you know, basically back to where they would have been. But if we can get a 3% raise, it'll be an actual raise for our, for our teachers. And then um, we, we are hearing about state support for pay increases. Uh, the governor's budget right now contains a 2% bonus for SOQ funded positions. We're hearing that the, the term bonus will likely be changed to raise, which is what we need to happen. You know, we need a raise instead of a bonus. So we're hoping that that comes out. And remember, with SOQ positions for school divisions, um, that for, for state and city schools in particular, that's only 40% of our positions that are funded by SOQ. So when the state tells you they're going to give you a raise, that's for 40% of our positions they're gonna fund at our composite index of 62%. So the city generally uh, pays 38% and you know locally funded in the state's 62%. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, when the state says we're gonna give you a 2% raise, that means we're gonna give 62% of a 2% raise to 40% of your employees. <laughs> And we've got to come up with the other 38% for that 40%, plus 100% for the other 60% of employees who aren't funded by SOQ. What does SOQ stand for, please? Standards of quality. Yes. No. Yep. So that, that's one that, you know, our school board's really pushing hard when we talk about what changes need to be made at the legislative le level. Fully funding SOQ position would, would be a nice place to start. Here, here is SOQ, is that the old W? George W. Bush's, uh, is that his administration's standards of, or am, am I? Mistaken? You know, I'm, not, you know I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's, I think it's been in place previous to, previous to his administration. Okay. But I can research that and get back. And then just yesterday, uh, the House came through uh, in the General Assembly with a proposal for a 5% raise for teachers. And the Senate came through with a 3% proposed teacher raise. So right now, there are currently just proposals in the General Assembly, but it, it looks like good news. And we hope that that comes to fruition. That, that'll make it easier for us to do these raises. On slide 10, we're proposing an additional 2% raise on top of the 3% for bus drivers, maintenance team, and cafeteria staff. So we're proposing for these employees a total of 5%. Now, they really are our pandemic heroes. You know, they never left. On March 13th, they've continued to provide meals, to, to, to continue to deliver meals if necessary, um, to, to make sure that our buildings aren't falling apart, to continue to implement new safety procedures, to install all of the extra equipment that we got through the CARES Act money. They have worked extremely hard. They've been repurposed. Uh, bus drivers helped move heavy furniture in 
you know, out of the old high school into the new high school. So they've been doing just about everything and they work extremely hard and we're very proud of them. And we want to recognize the extra work that they did for this year with a, by giving them a, an even bigger raise than the rest of the staff. We also want to increase the minimum wage to at least $11 an hour. Once we give this 5% pay increase to the non-professional staff, there's still about 10 people uh, left over that we need to up their um, hourly wage to get them up to $11 an hour. We wanna make sure everybody's at least there. The state has mandated that we need to be at $11 an hour by 2022, and we wanna stay ahead of the state mandates. And beyond that, our people deserve it. Um, so this implementation would happen on July 1st and it adds an extra $13,000 to the education fund costs. <laughs> on slide 11, entitled payroll adjustments, we wanna add a quarter of an hour, 15 minutes to elementary and middle school instructional assistance uh, schedules to facilitate bus loading and unloading. So that was in last year's budget, but cut. The cost for that is $57,000. We want to normalize salaries for six tenured instructional assistants with approximately 20 years of service. Again, that was in last year's budget, but got cut. That's at a cost of $28,000. And then based on an HR review, we have six individual salary, salary contract changes for a total of $68,000. And then finally, uh, $1,200 to increase access to interpreters due to growth in our English as a second language population. And we're back to more numbers and Brad's going to explain uh, kind of a new system that we um, implemented this year to prioritize our, our budget requests. So as you know, as a public entity, we have to balance our budget in terms of revenues have to equal expenditures. Um, so as you saw previously, we came up with an estimate of what we our best estimate at this point of what our revenues would be. We also had $3.8 million of, you know, desired expenditures to add to our budget. So obviously not everything is gonna make it over the hurdle. So we developed a system where uh, with the executive team and the leadership team of the schools, we took those 70 plus items that were budget requests and we prioritized them based on a variety of criteria. Um, we rank them between priority A, which means absolutely must have, cannot do without, to F, which is throw it out the window right now. Um, and then the other ones in between. Um, as you see on this page, uh, page 13, 12, um, these are the um, new positions that were requested, as well as uh, new stipends for uh, certain teachers and, and people. Um, in terms of, I mean, I, I don't want to read through this and I think you all can see very well sort of what, what's on the, on the, on the, on the, um, on our list here. Um, uh, additional SPED teachers, uh, we expect there's to be sort of a demand-driven increase in, in homeless students. It's gonna require more um, sped, uh, special ed teachers, school psychologists, and, and some of these spending uh, increases or requests we can offset with other funding sources such as ESSER fund offsets and that sort of thing. Um, you'll see uh, music and art teachers are added in here. Um, we also have a placeholder for teachers. Typically, we like to enter a school year not knowing what our uh, enrollment will be. Uh, it gives us some flexibility in the event that we do have a surge um, in students and need additional uh, um, teachers for larger cohorts. Um, down below, you see some stipends, uh, new stipends that have been requested. That includes one for the school board. We have determined that that won't be necessary to be funded this year um, because of the, the, um, the regulations for implementing a stipend uh, for school board members. Um, as you may know, um, St uh, Stanton is only one of two districts in our region that doesn't pay a stipend at all to the school board. It's, it's us in Lynchburg. 
are the only ones that yeah. don't pay a stipend at all to our school board members. I don't know. About that. Yeah, so there's sort of a built in lag. Uh, so what the board will probably do is, you know, seek to get that implemented. The first time we'll be able to pay a stipend wouldn't be until the beginning of the subsequent fiscal year, which would be FY23, which would be July 2022. So you're saying the school board has never had a stipend of any kind? Never, That's correct. No, never. never. Okay. They deserve they one. They know. <laughs> um, I'm going to flip over to the next page now. Uh, 13, sort of a summary of the uh, non compensation expenses. We had a $975,000 of, of budget requests. We were able to cut out about $380,000 of that through cuts, deferments, and CARES Act funding for a net increase of just about $600,000. And again, you can see our prioritization of those. Um, I would draw your attention about uh, the top of the, I guess the uh, B priorities, electricity consumption and natural gas consumption. Um, we've increased the budget for electricity uh, by $10,000 a month. And that's principally, and, and, and same logic goes behind the natural gas, natural gas consumption, is that with the new high school, we don't have a baseline. We don't know how much energy that facility is going to use. So we want to make sure that we don't under budget. Um, also, a little bit further down, you'll see fuel price increase. Depending on the way the economy goes, if we dip towards recession, we may anticipate or may expect to see gas fuel prices to increase. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is, is covering ourselves in that regard, too, because we expect Although we haven't been using a lot of fuel this year because of, of COVID, right. it's going to kick back in next year. And, you know, we want to be able to absorb any increases in fuel prices. Um, so flipping over to page 14, we, we did the exercise to sort of see what would be cut out of these requests to get us close to a balanced budget. And you can see we've taken out the board stipend, some uh, online registration software. Um, we've reduced our contracted subs budget um, and a variety of other items in there. Um, some we've cut completely, some we've cut half. Um, and if you flip to the next page here, you see that with- Hey Oaks, I, I have a question as a friend of me. Sure. Council member me. Yeah, what, what are contracted subs? What's included in that? Uh, contracted subs is, are, is uh, those are the um, substitute teachers that we bring into the school when we have teacher absences. Are, are you expecting the, the, to need fewer of those in the next fiscal well, Uh, good evening, Councilwoman Mead. One of, so this year when we made the cuts, you know, it was such a drastic change for the teachers to, to become expert at be, being virtual teachers and at the same time, you know, trying to be hybrid teachers. And so when we started last year and looked at we, what we could cut, our main goal was to not cut anybody's salary. So we wanted no one to lose their job. And so when we went into the non-cops, we basically cut, you know, most of our substitute budget. That meant that, you know, teachers have had to cover for each other, staff have had to cover for each other. But even, but even beyond that, it's really hard to find a single substitute who would have the skill set to replace a teacher on any given day. It's changed so much in the past year. Vice so, Mayor Robertson. Um, sure. Derek, maybe, and may, you know, I said I'm one of the newbies, so I don't know, sure. but just thinking out loud, I mean, you, you know, yes, there are certain places where you're asking for increases in budget. Tell me, I mean, what we budgeted last year, okay, yep. you, you, and there's a lot of, like, you didn't spend as much electricity. You didn't spend as much fuel. Yep. You didn't spend as much on uh, teachers, per se, or whatever, in these cases. Is that money still sitting there that could then be 
moved over to put to pay for part of the increases you want i'm i'm just asking well that relates back to the beginning of my discussion um those funds left carryover funds from this fiscal year um would become what happens is those funds go into our our reserve so any savings so whereas in this current year we pulled seven hundred fifty thousand dollars out of our reserve to balance the budget we would have to do that again we'd have to do a budget amendment to pull those funds into our operating budget yeah and you talked about how much it was chopped last year so for example on in the case of well the the substitute budget the contracted subs budget we cut that by 60 percent last year to help balance the budget um we think we can sort of offset that because we are trying to get some permanent, semi-permanent floaters in the schools that can step in and we can pay for those individuals using uh, federal CARES funds. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm not sure I answered your question. Council Member Claffy. Well, let me try to ask another question. How many reserve funds are left from fiscal year 20? We're currently in 21, correct? So this yes. would have been the year that was cut off. Right. So how many dollars are in fiscal year 20 reserve funds? Our current reserve balance is a You said 900,000? Okay. Thank you. That's our current reserve, yes. You might as well tell them the last slide and just note that one change on the budget calendar. Yes, so um, we got the balance within the budget to balance within $200,000. And as I stated at the beginning, everything's in flux until we get uh, a final budget template from the state. So we figure out what the appropriation is from the city and, and ultimately what the, what the federal budget is going to look like. Um, so we're pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got a lot of adjusting to do, and we're going to probably go through and reprioritize all these budget requests again uh, with our with our administration and leadership team, and come back to you all. And so, uh, flipping over the last page is just up. Is our is our budget calendar moving forward? I want to point out that the next um, down near the bottom, where we have March twenty fifth, is the next joint work session. That date should be April eighth, and that's my error. Okay, we've still got 14 minutes for uh, questions. So we, we came close. Yeah. I couldn't help but notice only only school people could come up with the A through F system for prioritizing. <laughs> I saw that. Uh, I didn't even realize that until we were standing up. Council member Claffy. Okay, going back to um, the summer school issue. Um, what year fun, um, controls the money that goes into your summer school? Okay. I know we get out of school in May, and the fiscal year changes July 1. Right. So this year's summer school that's, right. that's 90 days in front of us, is that going to be funded out of 21 or 22? Well, but I can tell you how it's funded. Okay. So, so the state allows a per pupil uh, funds for students served in summer school. So you get a certain amount of uh, money per pupil to serve in summer school. So you report to the state how many students are, are participating. And then your next year's allotment for summer school is based on how many participated last year. One of the things that happened last year was we had to do a virtual summer school, which tripled our enrollment. So we're expecting a lot more money for summer school this year. In addition, the ESSER II funds can be used for learning loss that, that transpired over the pandemic. So we've surveyed uh, our teachers and staff and we've got all kinds of ideas about how to um, close these, um, these learning losses over the summer. So when we say summer school is on steroids, on steroids, you know, in our mind, there is gonna be a, a remediation piece. You know, that there are kids who need to close, close gaps, but we also see an enrichment piece because kids have been isolated for a long time and we wanna create opportunities for them to get out and socialize and do some things that they otherwise would never have the opportunity to do. Gary, I'm Vice Mayor Robertson. 
that yeah, that's what because that's what worries me. I mean, I'm just I've, I asked you before. I'm I'm really concerned about our students because I think they you know they're there's a lot of parents that aren't yes. really cut out to teach. That is correct. And and these I mean previously A students have come up flunking in cases. Yep. And I you know is is you said summer school on steroids. Is it going to be a case where it's going to be a mandatory summer school? Or no. I mean, how do you catch? How are you going to catch these kids up? Yeah, it'll be really hard to do a, man, a mandatory summer school. Um, even right now, offering two options: with virtual and hybrid. We have some, you know, students from families who've chosen virtual, and we really would prefer they be in, in the hybrid model right mm -hmm. now. So it's tough to it's tough to mandate it. Um, but another thing that we're working on, because I've been thinking about that comment that you made, did some research over the winter break, and we are joining with a cohort from Region 7 for the Comprehensive Instructional Program. And I can get you all some research on that if you're interested. So we, our principals met with uh, Dr. Matt Hurt, who is their kind of data guru. But in the southwestern, far southwestern part of the state where Region 7 is, over the last five years, they've made tremendous gains on their SOL results. And they've done it with a very simple approach. They figured out who the best teachers were in all the grade levels and subjects. They picked their brains and they, they get together and based on what they've learned from the best teachers, they've restructured their pacing guides, their benchmark testing, they've created opportunities for teachers to collaborate. And so what we see is some of the poorest school divisions in the state with some of the best test scores in the state. And so it. we are joining, we are joining the CIP and they're hitting us with an exorbitant cost of $2 per student per year. So we think it's, you know, it's a, it's a great bargain. Um, one of the things that really caught our attention is uh, they kind of have a, a, a graph where they, they plot all the school divisions in Virginia. So they roll up all your SOL scores into one score and you have quadrants. So working across the um, X axis would be relative poverty and the Y axis is uh, performance on SOL tests. So as you, as you move to the right, you know, you have a higher degree of poverty and Stanton's pretty far over to the right. As you move up, you have higher SOL scores. So what you see from the region seven is they're all in the top right quadrant, meaning they have high levels of poverty and very high SOL scores. Wow. And we're very excited to, you know, learn from that. It's not gonna be major adjustments for our teachers either. It's gonna be things like you move all the most difficult to teach and learn concepts into the front of the pacing guide. You teach them all in the first quarter. And that, and even though that's, you know, that's not what we've traditionally done, we've kind of, you know, patty caked them the first quarter with last year's standards, it's kind of ease them into it. The theory is you hit them with all the hardest standards in the beginning because it gives them the rest of the year to learn their standards. And so you challenge them right off the, right off the bat. The benchmark tests are all about alignment. You know, you need to teach what they're going to be tested on. And so we're, we're feeling uh, very excited about moving in this direction because we were anticipating getting this question again. What are you doing differently? You said there's summer learning loss, or there's pandemic learning loss in this case. So what are you doing differently? So the things we are doing differently is expanding our summer school offerings, joining the CIP, um, changing kind of our approach to pacing and benchmarking. And, um, you know, we feel confident we can, we can close these gaps. Our teachers are, are excellent. And, and if anyone can do it, they can do it. I appreciate that answer. Thank you. Sure. Right. Any additional questions? Okay. Yes, this is Carol Dahl. Carolyn Dahl. Yes, I got a couple questions. One is, I thought I heard that the governor was going to put money in the budget to make sure schools were not harmed by um, uh, if, if they lost students, because evidently that's been a problem uh, around. So is there any follow up on that information? Yes, it appears that school divisions in Virginia will be held harmless for enrollment loss due to the pandemic. We'll get a break for one year. Okay, my, and my second question is, uh, have, you, have you started looking at solar panels for the schools? Because there's some very attractive uh, opportunities evidently because I think we're the, probably the, uh, the, not the innovator in that area because other school systems uh, adjacent to us have already uh, uh, gotten solar panels and that would help with the fuel costs, I would think. Yes, we, we, have, done some, we have done some research on solar panels and uh, had some initial conversations. 
we haven't moved it forward any further than that yet, but I ha I do know, uh, we didn't go forth with it yet, but we do know that companies will come and do an assessment of all your schools to kind of give you a general you know, idea of what it would cost to do it, how long a contract you'd have to sign, and how much money would save over your current costs. So we're very open to exploring those options. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Great, any additional questions? Um, I would just like to state that it is my belief the school board should receive a stipend because you guys do so much work. And as a past school board member, I, rem I can recall all the, the meetings, the phone calls, I mean, all of the uh, hard work that you put into creating the school's budget. Um, so it's unfortunate that it's going to be dropped off. But you had mentioned that uh, the school board cannot uh, vote to give themselves a stipend. I was under the impression um, during the reorganization meeting that that could be brought up and voted on. So that's news to me. Yes, yeah, so my understanding is, you know, if, if the school board, our current school board voted next year to, to have a stipend, then when we get to the next round of elections, only the newly elected board members would get the stipend to start. And then we'd have to go through one more cycle before oh, wow. we got there. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Lots of rules. It happens in the federal government too. Yeah. 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 And there's yeah. six school board members. Right. So. Um, well, all of you guys deserve a stipend. That's for sure. Um, Dr. Smith, did you want to comment on the um, operations of a consolidation of facilities within the school system as far as storage, um, sure. cold food storage, sure. and your um, buses. Sure, we recently uh, uh, made a presentation uh, with the Economic Development Authority, kind of trying to outline um, our needs. And uh, like I, I mentioned earlier, our, our maintenance department has been located in the basement of Shelburne Middle School for 50 years. It's very cramped, it's very crowded. Our, our employees are, are top notch. They're very skilled in a lot of areas, but they're working in very cramped and crowded conditions. Uh, one of the examples of uh, how it's just, it's just, not, it's just not an acceptable situation is that we have a vehicle lift in there. Um, our guys work on the vehicles. Sometimes the fumes from the work will drift up into the classrooms above and then the teachers and the students will have to evacuate their classrooms for a period of time until the smell goes away. So, you know, 50 years of that seems like a long time. And we would like to recapture those learning spaces for our students. And it started with a site study of Shelburne. You know, we have our architect under contract. So we did a site study of Shelburne while the architect was already paid for to modernize and improve some of our indoor and outdoor learning spaces. But in order to move forward with some of the plans we have there, um, that are reflected in our CIP, we need to get the maintenance guys out of the basement there and get them a place to work. And while we're talking about it, our bus garage is not a garage at all. It's just a lot. It's a gravel parking lot. Our employees are out in the, in, in the weather, you know, in the elements. Um, we have 36 buses crammed in there with hardly any space in between them. If our mechanic wants to work on buses, he has to do it outside in the in the cold. We have a tiny lot to fit 35 more school employees there. So um, again, these are our heroes from the pandemic. Their working conditions aren't acceptable. And in fact, I'm amazed we can get people to work for us under those conditions with the wages that we're paying. And I think it would just be a tremendous, I mean, strategically, it would make a lot of sense for us to consolidate our operations. But even beyond that, you know, our, our employees deserve better. I mean, they shouldn't have to work outside in the cold or in the basement, in the cramped basement of a, of a middle school. It's not good for kids or teachers, or, you know, or our maintenance staff. And we just, we feel like we've got uh, a good solution to that problem. And if we were given the opportunity, we'd love to move forward with it. You know, it was just a couple of years ago where we came in front of city council and we asked city council to extend our $40 million for the construction of the high school to $46 million. Uh, the, the, the city council generously did that. And we went out and, and went ahead and, and, and did the project and knocked it out on budget and on time. As a means of comparison, uh, a neighboring school division was on the exact same timeline as us for the construction of a high school. An architect that was in the interview process with us dropped out because 
they were they were getting the Harrisonburg High School project. Mm -hmm. It was the same size school, about 900 students. And the architect told me, you know, I've, I'd worked with him before um, in Newport News Public Schools on a school construction project. Mm -hmm. He told me, Garrett, I'm sorry, our, our architecture firm isn't big enough to do two schools at one time. And we've got this other project. Well, the other project still has not started and we're finished. And what we want to ask, you know, for city council um, is if, you know, if we, if we can get the opportunity for this consolidated operations facility, we want to prove to you that we can deliver again on budget and on time and at the lowest cost for taxpayers. And it will move our school division forward. Our goal is still to be the best school division in the state. And we're going to keep pushing hard to, to that end. All right. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Yes, this is Carolyn Dole. Carolyn. Have, have you looked at the, there's a whole lot of, um, a good number of uh, vacant properties on the West End that might have um, facilities that could be re renovated, rebuilt, whatever. And uh, uh, to me, that would be like uh, increasing traffic to the West End, which would help the West End. Uh, and it might be cheaper. Yeah, we've looked at several several options. We haven't discovered one that would be um, really even close uh, to, to being cheaper than the solution that we focused on originally, but we're still open to any and all solutions. Okay. Yep. Um, um, Vice Mayor Roberts. I said, Carolyn, you and I are kind of on agreement on that, but is it something, Garrett, that would, that would have to be, I know consolidated would be great, but I mean, if, if there would be a, a big enough uh, place out on the West End to do one, like say the bus thing, or maybe do your cold storage, and then maybe you can find another, pro, uh, you know, area out there as well to maybe do your bus area. I, I mean, I'm just asking, or is it like set in stone, we've got to have one large enough place to consolidate. It would be much more functional if we could, if we could have it in one place. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would also be advantages for some city departments. Um, we've had conversations with, with Parks and Parks and Rec, uh, the police department, um, and others about, you know, how they could also benefit from a consolidated facility mm -hmm. in, in partnership with us. But uh, to answer your question, it, that would be, it, it'll be expensive and time consuming. I think any of those solutions are three or four years out. We're ready to go right now. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the team to, to do it and, uh, and, and we're ready to mobilize right now. We think we can get it done fairly quickly. Any projects that are, you know, three, four years down the road. I mean, I, we've been waiting 50 years, 35 years, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we've got a great team and we're, we're ready to mobilize right now if we can get the opportunity. Okay. All right. Thank you. We have um, two minutes left. Uh, Chairman Venable, would you like to make any comments or if any of the school board members would like to make a comment? Yes, Matt, Matt, Madam uh, Mayor, the only comment I'd like to make is when we're trying to consolidate to one functional facility. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the corporate arena for about 40 years and looking at everything, trying to find it's the best solution and the site we look at has all the solutions, all the other sites, and I'm born and raised in Stan. Mm -hmm. I've looked at all of them. None of them have cold storage. And see, we're, we're paying outside storage for our food and all like that. So to bring it all in on one facility and the time to turn it around is the short term. So we're trying to be as efficient cost-wise to do that. And... Um, one, one facility can do that, and it's, um, it's not expensive for the city. But if we have to go out and look at buying land and to pull all that in, it's really going to cost a lot more money. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Well, that leads us to our break. I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, to Dr. Smith um, and all of the school board, thank you for participating in this um, joint work session with the city council. Um, this is some very good information. Um, we may end up having additional questions. So I'm assuming it's okay if we reach out sure. to sure, you and to the school board members. So thank you. 
Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Look forward to working for you. And Chairman Venable, did you need to close out your um, oh, yeah. I mean, school yes. board? <laughs> yes, Madam Mayor and school board. At this time, I'd like to adjourn on Stanton City School Board. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you to yeah. the school board members for participating. Thank everyone. Thank you. All right. Um, we are now on break. I... We'll be back at 6.15, back into the work session. Okay. We're now back from break. And the next item is item number three, a presentation by Valley Community Service Board. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Assistant City Manager Leslie Beauregard will present this item. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor Oates, members of council. Uh, this evening we have joining us on Zoom, we have Dr. Kimberly McClanahan, who's the Executive Director of Valley Community Services Board. And if you remember back on December 10th at your work session, uh, she came before you to speak about a few issues. She's returning this evening to speak more about the crisis stabilization program at the CSB and the benefits of a local community crisis center. And I believe joining her is her board chair, Mr. Dan Sullivan. And so with that, I'll be happy to turn it over to Dr. McClanahan. All right, welcome. Uh oh, That helps when I'm not- There needed. we go. Um, <laughs> So thank you very much for having me back. I really appreciate it. Uh, as I was saying to Mr. Rosenberg and Ms. Beauregard a little earlier while you were on break, I wish I were there uh, in the room. But uh, when I came out of the office and saw two inches of snow on my car, I thought coming home was probably a better option and to be virtual. But I would much prefer to, to be in the room. Um, in December, I think we talked a little bit about crisis stabilization units and uh, of course we don't have one in our area although this is not uh, something that has not been uh, talked about before. Uh, we do a lot of emergency services out of Valley. Uh, one of the things we and we do a lot of those in terms of uh, detention orders and emergency orders uh, actually at Augusta Health their emergency department. Uh, right now we're doing a lot of those things uh, virtually with COVID. Um, and back in 2017, the end of 2017, there were three entities, Augusta Health, Central Shenandoah Health District and Valley uh, Community Services Board engaged a national company, by MTM, uh, to look at the continuum of care in the Augusta County and surrounding areas. Uh, and at that time, uh, Augusta Health led the effort. There is a white paper uh, that is public uh, knowledge. So if, uh, if anybody wants to have that uh, after this is over, I'm happy to get it to Ms. Beauregard and, or whomever and get it to you. Uh, but the essence of that time was that without a proper continuum of care, uh, people with behavioral health and addiction issues uh, would obviously be in emergency rooms more, would be hospitalized more, would be in jail more, uh, would suffer homelessness and the, those kinds of things that happen all the time. So uh, it was like, there is a real need for a crisis stabilization unit in this area. Uh, and that was the essence of this um, white paper that came out uh, back in 2017. Or, uh, the white paper itself probably didn't come out until 2018 because they started this process in 2017. And at that time, there were quite a few stakeholders uh, in the area. Uh, who were interested in this, thought it was important. Uh, in fact, uh, one that's not in the white papers, interestingly, is Stanton City. I uh, don't know uh, what was going on then that uh, you all were not represented uh, or if it somehow got left out of the white paper, but there were quite a few uh, others who were interested and involved at that time. And I know that uh, the mayor was uh, speaking in December about your interest at this time. Um, you know, there are two uh, crisis stabilization units uh, within 50 miles of us at CSBs. One is in Harrisonburg, Rockingham, the other, which is in Harrisonburg, the other is Region 10, uh, where um, they are in Charlottesville. So we can get people in there, but it can take up to 10 days. 
Uh, and at that point, they're either in the hospital, the crisis is resolved, uh, or you know, in the worst case scenario, uh, they would be no longer with us because they would have killed themselves. Um, so we really wanted to, uh, they really wanted to do this back then. And there were several groups, let me just turn to my correct page here. There were several groups who did different studies about, uh, you know, what, what, why do we need this? And CAPSAW, I think you all are familiar with the Community Action Partnership of San Augusta and Waynesboro. Uh, they did some surveys. They found that 42.2% of their responders respond to five community needs over the next three years. Remember, that was in 2017. And 12% said that mental health services was the single most important issue. Augusta Health similarly uh, commissioned a needs assessment in 2016, also found uh, very much that mental health and substance abuse ranked number two and three respectively as top ranked problems by key informants in the surveys. And there are a number of uh, other uh, statistics that I could share with you uh, about that. Um, you know, CSUs do work, uh, but you have to have the resources to actually uh, fund them. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things there uh, that, you know, they, you know, obviously they keep people out of the hospital, they keep them out of emergency rooms, they're more likely to get back into the community sooner, they're less likely to wind up in jail. Uh, they also save money. These are uh, nation, nation, national surveys and uh, studies that have been done uh, that when you're looking at what some people call frequent flyers, people who end up in the emergency room a lot uh, in like five or six times over a period of six months, uh, from 39% pre uh, CSU to 14% post CSU. So you're decreasing the amount of uh, time and people who are in the emergency department. Uh, and it also actually decreased mental health hospitalization from 2 million prior to the stabilization unit to 1.1 million uh, post stabilization. So almost a million dollars. Uh, I also found that the return on investment was about $3.19 for every person that actually got helped uh, in a, a CSU. Uh, and, you know, we provide at Valley many uh, crisis services, uh, including uh, the TDOs and the ETOs, those kind of uh, services that end up getting people in the hospital. Uh, and we also uh, do uh, ongoing outpatient crisis stabilization, that sort of thing. Uh, but of course, we do not have the uh, luxury of having a, a crisis stabilization unit. Uh, and I'm looking at my time and I know that it's short. So let me uh, talk. So the idea from, that came out of this white paper was that there was, they really wanted to have uh, a CSU. My understanding historically, I was not here, was that it was gonna be placed close to Augusta Health Hospital and emergency room so that there would be uh, the ability to get people in and out if you needed to. They were proposing a 16 bed unit with a five to seven day stay at that time. Um, MTM also anticipated that first year expenses would be approximately $2 million, a little bit over. That included non-personnel expenses and personnel costs. It did not include the cost of a building. Um, they also anticipated revenue to almost break even that first year, uh, but they also, as I read this white paper, assumed that the state would be paying about 1.6 million of that, uh, which I don't see happening. Um, so that's uh, a quick uh, kind of overview. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, I have worked in a state at, or in an organization that had both an adult and child uh, crisis unit. Uh, they are very useful uh, and it depends on how you uh, work them and, but they are hard to sustain financially. Uh, could we use one? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Virginia in the last Mental Health America poll was, uh, which 
is better. Uh, it's 26 overall among the states in terms of mental health. Uh, and, uh, but we are 47th among states in adults with a mental illness who reported they were not able to get the treatment they needed. So that's not a good place to be. We're also 40, 41st in access to trained mental health workforce. So as I think I even mentioned last time I was there, you know, workforce issues continue. Um, I think I've taken my 10 minutes. I was uh, told I could get 15 and that uh, if you all wanted to ask questions. Uh, You've got five minutes to ask those and I will do my best to answer them or get back with you with an answer. Great, thank you. Are there any questions by council members? All right, and hearing none, I just wanna say thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, you're right, uh, the placement for the state of Virginia um, is so incredibly low. We need to see what we can do to uh, service are folks that need the mental disability guidance. Um, and so thank you for everything that you all are doing to help our community. And we'll see what we can do to um, push Virginia up as far as the numbers are concerned when it, um, when it relates to offering mental health awareness as well as um, recognizing the different areas of mental health, whether it be adults or children. So thank you. Arrow, Arrow, I'm sorry, this is Brenda Mead. I just wanted to say that as we consider the um, issue of the expansion of Middle River Regional Jail, um, not expanding the jail uh, will not solve the community issues like mental health issues. Um, we, we need to address those issues. It is very expensive for us to put uh, folks in the Middle River Jail who are in need of mental health for any length of time. It increases recidivism and, um, and they don't get the kind of care that they need to, um, to be uh, back outside in the community in a healthy way. So this uh, crisis stabilization uh, unit may be one of those uh, solutions to the problem of overcrowding in our jail. And, uh, and I, I don't think, I don't think we're, we're going to get off scot-free on this issue of jail expansion. If we, we can't just say no, we have to figure out how to deal with the underlying issues in the community. And that's going to mean we'll, we'll, we'll need to consider spending some money on it. Currently, Valley has uh, three therapists and a case worker who work in the jail. Uh, and, but we would certainly agree that uh, that is not the place for folks, uh, many folks with mental health issues uh, needing to uh, be in a place where they can get those needs met uh, in, in a better fashion, either as a step up from uh, the community or the jail or step down from uh, the hospital to really get stabilized and then back in the community. Uh, of course, the other thing is, is that many times, even when people are coming in, out of the hospital, this would also be true uh, out of a crisis unit, they have to have some place to go. Uh, yeah. And uh, so that, you know, always brings up that issue of housing uh, right. and a, a stable community living place. But I agree with you, Ms. Mead, uh, that we, uh, obviously I'm, I'm biased, but I think we need to spend money on uh, the behavioral health of our citizens. I agree. Cheaper in the long run. That, absolutely true. Well, we certainly need to focus on mental health stability prior to incarcerating um, individuals. So it, it's very true. We need to focus on it um, before and certainly during and even after um, any sort of incarceration. We want to make sure that um, all our citizens receive the treatment that they so deserve. So again, thank you for everything that you're doing for the community. You are so welcome and thank you for having me back. And I'd be delighted to talk with you more about these or other issues. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, our next item is item four. Item four on the work session, item B on the regular meeting agenda. Mr. Rosenberg, this is concerning the um, proposed CIP. Muted. You're muted, Steve. 
Thank you. There you go. Um, Madam Mayor, uh, Phil Chair, the city's chief finance officer will present this item. I will just note uh, for your benefit that the next item on the agenda could easily be handled all at once um, during the regular meeting if the discussion on the CIP runs long and, and you feel, council feels that you need the additional 10 minutes uh, during the work session, uh, item five can easily be accommodated during the regular meeting. Mr. Right. Chair. Welcome, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Rosenberg, Madam Mayor, members of council, pleasure to be here this evening. Tonight, we are here for a final review of the FY21-25 CIP plan. This year's five-year plan, both scheduled and unscheduled, equals $254,000. $413,000 and was introduced at the January 14th, 2021 meeting, followed by a February 4th, 2021 special called meeting to further review the plan. The school board approved their side on January 11th, 2021. The planning commission conducted a public hearing on January 21st, 2021, which was properly advertised and recommended approval of the plan afterwards. Scheduled CIP equals 83,074,000. The breakout includes general fund, 46196000 school fund, 9356000 water fund, 19805000 sewer fund, 1805000 stormwater fund, 4223000 parking fund, 1688000 Slide three provides a breakout of the unscheduled unfunded projects. I think this was referenced last week. The unscheduled portion of the CIP equals 171,339,000. Breakout includes general fund, 106,724,000. School fund, 15 million. Water fund, 25,620,000. Sewer fund, 4,035,000. Storm water fund, 19,959,000. Parking fund, zero. Although we call this portion of the plan unfunded and unscheduled, the CIP is actually a plan and that only the items that appear in FY21 and 22 will actually be funded within the FY21-22 fiscal years. Other scheduled projects in the outer years, FY23 to FY25, are in reality placeholders uh, and are planned projects with planned sources of fund. In other words, we do not have $46 million in cash sitting in a CIP account waiting to be drawn down. Slide four will look familiar to everyone as this summarizes our projects and planned funding sources. Planned funding sources in this slide, again, are color coded as follows. Orange represents budget transfers from the general fund to the CIP fund to cover high dollar equipment replacement, maintenance and repairs, sidewalks, VDOT matching, et cetera. Purple represents carryover budget amendments to fund a combined one-time projects as well as reserves for greenway and bike path projects. You also will see the Middle River Regional Jail is on this list as a placeholder to offset operational impact of potential expense increases. Again, the plan under this scenario, we will apply carryover funds to the jail first to mitigate operational budget impacts. Green is projects funded via the issuance of debt. This includes the emergency radio, police station, fire station and school warehouse projects. Uh, red is projects funded by VDOT, yellow the telephone project, network switches telephone projects has been funded via FY21's budget amendment that was approved in December, 2020. Items in blue will be funded via 22 budget amendment, which will occur in the second quarter of FY22. Gray is funded via current CIP reserves. On slide five, we will look at the appropriation status of the FY21 project slash reserves. In the case of FY2021, it's pretty easy. Everything has been appropriated by council already. Most of the projects and reserves were appropriated via FY2020's budget amendment, which was which appropriated FY2019's carryover. The total in this area is 725,000. The courthouse roof replacement was appropriated via two different sources, the first being the above referenced FY2020 budget amendment for $150,000. The second from reserves, which were built up in the public works maintenance line, $200,000. Finally, our most recent addition, again, the network phone project for $1 million that was approved in December. On slide six, we will look at FY22's funding status. 
As a practice, Stanton has budgeted general fund monies to fund reserve to address high cost items, including reserves for fire equipment, sidewalk projects, public works items, and education funding. These items are expensed via, are expensed via a general fund transfer and will be included in FY22 budget and will be appropriated at the time the budget is approved. The emergency radio project for $1.6 million is part of the $4 million project. $400,000 was appropriated via budget amendment number four in December 2020, and the balance will need to be appropriated at the time council considers debt issuance. Next, street reserves, traffic control equipment. These are scheduled for appropriations during FY22 via, via carryover budget amendment to incur again in the second quarter of FY22. Slide seven shows projects and reserves which are fully appropriated. These projects can proceed if council approves the plan as presented. This first section is a mixture of reserves and projects and was appropriated via budget amendment number four in December, 2020. As you can see, most of these are mostly reserve provision, but does include HVAC funding as well as planning and inspection software. Next was the VDOT funded projects, 1.4 million. And finally, in the last section, we have $250,000 in projects, which includes the West Beverly Street, Rupert Sidewalk project and golf carts. Funding for both projects are from previously appropriated CIP funds, one from sidewalk project line and the other from unassigned CIP funds. Both will be in a position to proceed if council approves the CIP this evening. Slide eight. Last week, uh, we, we had had a question uh, concerning the uh, status of reserves. Slide eight shows the current status of reserves, which are funded annually through the CIP process. The fire truck reserve is in a negative status, but we expect that to be significantly mitigated by the sale of the old ladder truck, as well as FY22 reserve funding. Reserve balances include the fire truck minus 801,000, VDOT matching 321,000, sidewalks 700,000, public works equipment 217,000, public works building fund 143,000, Street projects, 85,000, adaptive control equipment, 214,000, bike and pedestrian projects, 125,000, greenway projects, 400,000, and regional jail reserves, 319,000. And that's what I have for you at this time. I'll be happy to address any questions that you may have. All right, are there any questions for Mr. Dreyer? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trayer. Yes. All right, so that, as stated, that will also appear on the regular meeting agenda as item number B. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item five for the uh, work session and item C for the um, regular meeting agenda. It's a discussion of proposed FY 2022 holiday schedule. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, John Venn, the city's uh, chief human resources officer, will present this item. Madam Mayor, members of council, um, as you are aware, the city of Stanton observes 10 paid holidays annually, plus any other holidays that you all designate um, for city employees. For FY22, we are recommending the 10 paid holidays that are listed in your briefing, uh, plus adding June. 20th in recognition of Juneteenth holiday in 22. Um, as the briefing indicates in regards to the addition of Juneteenth day, uh, the General Assembly in the 2020 special session passed and signed a bill of the governor establishing Juneteenth as an official legal state holiday. Uh, and with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding the proposed FY22 holiday schedule. All right, are there any questions by council members? Council member Clappy? Approximately how much does each added holiday cost the city? I would have to uh, get with Mr. Trayer on that, Mr. Clappy, to, I, I do not have that information readily available, but I certainly can get that. Vice Mayor Robertson. In my under, the understanding, John, that <clears throat> we're adding Juneteenth but we're taking, on the other hand, we're taking away possibly one of the additional days during Christmas, at least. Because, you know, the city typically gets to, like, say, it's been on falls during the week. So, you get a Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, so it, it's falling on a Saturday this year. Right. 
Um, so we would, in this case, we are recognizing Friday before Christmas and the Friday before New Year's Day. Um, we have, just so you know, uh, in a scenario back in FY11, when Christmas fell on a Saturday, City Council approved um, the Christmas Day was recognized. Let's see, let me make sure, I'm, I'm sorry. So the same situation happened in 2010 mm -hmm. and the same schedule we're proposing uh, was proposed and approved by City Council back then. Christmas Day fell on a Sunday in 2016 and City Council approved the Friday before and the Monday after we can add it two additional days. Does that make sense? So it's falling on a Saturday this time. Um, so clearly you all could approve two additional days allowing city staff to be off, not only on the Friday preceding the holiday, but the Monday following that ho holiday. But the way it's um, laid out right now, the proposed- That is correct. Holiday calendar, um, there are the same number of days being given this um, this upcoming holiday as it, as it was this past holiday, because I mean, you've taken away the uh, basically the the uh, Christmas Eve has been taken away. Yeah. However, the Juneteenth has been added, so it's 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 even as far as the same number of days. I believe that is correct. I don't have that in front of me. I believe okay. that is correct. Mr. Rosenberg, um, did you have a question or or did you? Yeah, is. Am I correct in what I'm stating that it's the same number of days? I, I think that that's correct. I think the important thing here is that it, there's variability every year. And what we try to do, especially with Christmas and um, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day is to be consistent across the years and wow. how we handle those four days and look back to see how they were treated when those holidays fell on the same day of the week in a prior year. And so there's always variability in the total number of holidays. It may range from, I think, 10 to 12 in any given year, depending upon how the Christmas and New Year's holidays fall. So, so what, what was, uh, what I shared with you earlier in 2010, we're proposing the exact same schedule except adding Juneteenth Day, which would be 11 paid holidays. In the 2016, there were 12 paid holidays because city council approved the Friday before and the Monday afterwards. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's No, no, and, I, I and, understand. It, because coming from the retail world, I'm going like, you know, we we don't add all these. You know, we just don't do that. I mean, you got to be open to dispense drugs and whatever. And right. I, I mean, I, I understand we pay 10, 10 paid holidays, but you know, then you're adding Juneteenth. Nothing wrong with that. But then down the road, depending on when Christmas or, for, or Thanksgiving falls, and we're going to give those two days there. So, like I said, we we do ten. Plus, they got a personal day. So I mean, it could extend. You know where. Yeah. You said 12, so 13 now. Yeah, so Mr. Rosenberg is correct. It's, it, it varies from 10 yeah. to 12 days, depending okay. on how the holidays fall okay. each year. So it could so, be at 13 now. Well, so in this, in uh, this case. No, sir. The personal oh. holiday is included in the count of 10. So actually at 10 days, this is the lowest amount the city would ever yes. pay out. Oh, okay. All right. So, it gets so, so 10 is on the low end. Okay, exactly. All right. That's correct. All right. Yeah. All right. I just assumed that ten was a kind of like a set figure that the, the city gave. And oh, right. okay. There's so, it in the policy. That is correct. You're right. There are ten set paid holidays, right. and then you all can deviate or add any additional holidays. I.e., we're putting forth Juneteenth Day, and if that is something that you all end up approving, as the briefing indicates, we would at some point in the near future come to you all and add that to the personnel policy manual. And, and tell me again, how exactly how much that's gonna, just in other words, adding a holiday. Either. Yeah, I don't have the exact cost. Okay. okay. We certainly, I can work with Mr. Trayer and get you all that information okay. in terms of what the cost is. But again, the FY 2022 holiday budget um, does not have the Christmas Eve, but does have the Juneteenth. So it's, um, it's still the 10 days. So it's still the same. 
Uh, we could go back and add Christmas Eve if we so desire to do. That, yes, that is. So Christmas Eve, really, the, the reality of it is Friday, December 24th is Christmas Eve. That's right. going to be a holiday. And Saturday, right. Christmas falls on a Saturday. Okay, well then, I guess, essentially observing Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Leave it at 10. Yeah. All right. Got gotcha. you. Yep. Is that, every, is that everyone's uh, desire? Yeah. Any further I'm, questions? I'm fine with that. Okay. It, it, it is your desire. I realize we'll have to go into the oh, absolutely. regular uh, session, but as 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 shared this evening, that is something you all are good with. Am I correct? Uh, this is Brenda Mead, Mayor Oaks. A council member Mead. What what are we good with? What's presented, presented. before you? And including Juneteenth. Yes, but I mean, um, the Christmas Eve is on Friday, so that's being... Yeah, I get all that. I just okay. heard somebody said, keep it to 10, which would not include Juneteenth. So what you're looking at is our 11, including the personal day, 11. you're looking at 11 paid holidays in the FY22 holiday schedule. Correct. Yes. Okay, okay. and that's what we're good with. Yes, yes. 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 Thank you. All right. Are you all right with that, Ms. Mead? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I understood. Somebody said, are we good with that? And I heard somebody else say, keep it to 10. So I, I, I just want to be clear that we were talking about adopting this holiday schedule as proposed, yep. including Juneteenth and a, a personal holiday. Yes. Exactly. The Juneteenth yeah. would be part of the 10, and then they have the discretionary day. So it's 11, essentially. That is correct. A okay. total of 11 paid holidays. So. Exactly. Okay. Right. Madam Mayor. Um, yes, Mr. I would, just, I would just note that once council moves into the regular meeting and it's time to consider this matter, that if it's the desire of council to include Juneteenth on the holiday schedule, um, that the, mo the suggested motion contains specific language that references that holiday. It appears in brackets and the maker of the motion ought to include that language in the motion. Okay, did everybody hear that? I'm, I'm assuming Steve, you're saying I adopt the fiscal year with the addition of observance of June. That, that's correct. If that's the desire of the maker of the motion, I just wanna be clear that if if that holiday is going to be added, that it needs to be expressly referenced in the motion. Gotcha. Thank right. you. Any other questions? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, moving on to item number six, a discussion of uncodified emergency ordinance regarding additional conditions for use of electronic communications in meetings of city public bodies. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is a, a, a deferral from your last meeting um, in January. Um, it's a proposed ordinance that addresses a couple of issues that came up um, on January 14th when council last considered an extension of the continuity of government ordinance. Um, you'll recall that that uh, ordinance was extended with the um, electronic communications procedures um, extended in uh, through April 9th of 2021. And um, as council considered that extension, there were two issues that were raised in the discussions. Uh, one of those issues concerned uh, a requirement that council members participating in meetings on the electronic communications platform um, use the video feature on the platform um, during the course of the meeting. And so that issue is addressed in the draft ordinance that is before you this evening. Uh, and the second issue that was raised in the discussion on January 14th was a, a requirement that uh, council members who are not members of the nominations committee be accommodated um, in their attendance of nominations committee meetings by electronic communications platform. And so that also is addressed in the draft ordinance before you this evening. 
Um, I'm happy to address more specifically the provisions that are uh, made for in the ordinance. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And I also note that Andrew McRoberts, the city's interim attorney is on Zoom as well. He's prepared to address, uh, I think both practical and legal questions that you may have concerning either of these issues. And that can be done now during the work session or it can also be done uh, during the closed meeting toward the end of the regular meeting, uh, which, whichever council prefers. Thank you. All right. Um, what is the council's desire to have a conversation with Andrew McRoberts now or in the closed meeting? Now, I'd, I'd love to. I'm in agreement. Uh, me. Okay. Yep. All right. Are there any questions or comments by council members? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council member Mead. I had sent to Mr. McRoberts a couple of questions and wondered if he would go ahead and respond to those at this time. Um, Council member Mead, uh, you, you asked, let's see, let me make sure I've got the right ones here. Uh, Mr. McRoberts, this may not be the appropriate time for us to discuss those questions. Well, I'm happy to answer them. I'm just looking for them. I have a bunch of different questions I've written out answers to, and okay. I want to make sure I find the right ones here. Uh, this is the one about the EDA, or is this about, which one are you talking about? Uh, well, I had asked you, I think, uh, I, one of the questions was whether or not the nominations committee could limit the number of city council members who wish to attend a nominations committee meeting. Oh, okay. Well, and, and I think the answer to that is answered by uh, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, in all cases, uh, members of the governing body should be permitted to observe meetings of their committees, including the nominating committee. Um, and so you certainly have the right to attend and observe. The question really comes to, it becomes what sort of form does that attendance and observation take? My understanding, and I wasn't here when the dispute arose, but my understanding is there is a dispute over whether or not the nominating committee can conduct certain operations using Zoom, such as including interviewing potential nominees, uh, and then exclude uh, members of council that wish to attend also by Zoom. Um, you know, I have looked in the Freedom of Information Act and I've looked in the Continuity Government Ordinance. Uh, I have also talked to the uh, executive director at the Freedom of Information Act Council, uh, Advisory Council. And I have not found anything where it is mandated by law to allow that attendance or observation, which is otherwise mandated, to be by Zoom, uh, even if Zoom access is allowed by others. This, the general rule under the Freedom of Information Act is that if a body meets and can lawfully enter closed session, they can desire, they can decide for themselves who is necessary or appropriate to be in their closed session. And that includes um, presumably uh, discrimination amongst members of the council. Uh, now that said, uh, I really don't recommend it. And the reason I don't recommend it is that anytime a public body is taking an act and they're treating people differently, uh, it could raise concerns about potential discrimination. It could raise uh, issues about, uh, you know, issues under the ADA, under various other types of uh, uh, prohibitions against discrimination. It could raise even potentially First Amendment issues. And for, those, for that reason, and given the fact also, uh, from my observation, it's inexpensive to free to let council members attend Zoom if other members of council are attending Zoom uh, or nominees are attending by Zoom. You know, my advice is, even though there's no mandate to do it, and it's certainly up to the public body's choice what they do, as your lawyer, my job is to advise you to act in ways that avoid legal disputes, 
and avoids potential litigation. And so uh, I'm sort of saying two things. One is I don't think there's any prohibition against the kind of sort of Zoom discrimination that uh, I've learned about here. But that doesn't mean that it can't go on. I can't say it's illegal, uh, but I do not recommend it because anytime that you have uh, potential uh, sort of issues like that, it can potentially cause legal issues and, 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 and potential litigation. And certainly I wouldn't advise that, especially when it's so easy to avoid it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any additional questions? Th thank you for that answer, Mr. McRoberts. Um, yeah, Council Member Clappy. <laughs> could, could you, that was a wonderful answer and I appreciate it very much because I've been actively seeking the answer to that question now for a while and nobody seems to know. So could you possibly explain what the difference would be on the EDA? Because I'm well aware that my mayor was asked not to attend a closed session of the EDA. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of at a loss why you would do it for the EDA. Could you explain what the difference is and why that's possible? Sure, sure. Um, well, first of all, there's no legal reason, as I said, under the continuity of government ordinance and the FOIA itself, that a public body can't include or exclude whomever they wish if that body decides that certain people are desired in their meeting and other people are not. Uh, that's, I guess, the in the end, the whole reason behind a closed meeting is the public body can have a closed meeting without people they don't wish to be in there to be participating or observing. Uh, the difference between the EDA and the council, however, or in the council's nominating committee, is the EDA is not a committee of the Stanton Council. Uh, unlike the nominating committee that is a committee of the council appointed by the council and in fact uh, exercises uh, delegated duties and advises the council. Um, the EDA is an independent authority uh, set up by statute. Uh, its duties are set up by statute. And while it may informally give advice to council from time to time, uh, statutorily, uh, that's not part of its assigned duties. Its assigned duties are those that are set forth in the statute uh, regarding economic development authority. And even though council appoints it, it is not a committee uh, or, uh, 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 or, or other body uh, set up by council uh, to uh, advise or carry out delegated duties of council. So it's just fundamentally a different type of beast. As a result, and this is why it's important for this issue, because of that, then the requirement under uh, Virginia Code 2.23712F, which is the requirement for public bodies to permit um, must uh, required to permit um, members of council to attend their committees doesn't apply to the EDA. Uh, and so there is no mandate under the law for council members to be able to attend uh, the EDA meetings uh, or the EDA uh, council, uh, uh, excuse me, the EDA closed sessions. Uh, sorry if I've rambled on, but bottom line is the EDA is not a committee of the council. So council members are not mandated to be able to attend. Uh, and so the EDA certainly in their closed sessions doesn't have to allow any council member at all. And if it chooses to allow a council member, then that's in the discretion of the, uh, of the EDA. Okay, there, Vice Mayor thank, Roberts. Thank you very much. Sorry, <clears throat> Vice Mayor Roberts. Mr. McRoberts, as a matter of saying that, would it be true that at such time when council decides to end the pandemic emergency, um, uncodified, or codified, emergency. yeah, uncodified or codified emergency, then that would therefore end the Zoom meetings. Would that be true? Um, uh, it might end them as a routine course. Uh, that would revert back to the uh, standard language under FOIA, which allows electronic participation under a policy elected by the public body uh, under certain circumstances, including, um, you know, health and, and emergency 
or a personal issue, uh, I believe up to once or twice a year. Um, so there would still be some allowance for members of the public body to attend, um, but there's certainly nothing in there that prohibits participation by either people outside that public body or members of the public electronically if the public body wishes to allow that. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Madam Mayor. All right, Council Member Darby. Mr. Uh, McRoberts, in, in your legal opinion, um, where you've shared with us, you know, advised us regarding the Zoom and the use thereof in the nominating committee meeting or at, you know, um, the guidelines regarding the EDA. Uh, can you speak to your views in regards to consistency and making, you know, how, how all boards and commissions, if it's important in your opinion for us to be consistent in how, uh, you know, the boards, how they do business, if it's in person or if it's hybrid or if it's Zoom? Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly an important to be consistent. And, and one thing to remember is that the council, of course, in the end is in charge of its committees. Uh, and so if the council wishes to adopt a policy uh, to apply across the board, the council certainly may do so. Uh, it may also adopt an ordinance if it wishes to do so. Uh, and of course, those policies and ordinances would be binding on their committees since they report to and are committees of uh, the council. So if the council is concerned about consistency and wishes for their committees to behave the same way in, regarding these issues, uh, my advice would be to consider some sort of a policy. Um, you know, however, certainly ad hoc also works. Uh, but as you pointed out, uh, council member, uh, it certainly may not be consistent. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to piggyback on council member Darby's question. With what we have before us now, it specifically points out the nominations committee. Um, reviewing the March 24th, 2020 uh, ordinance, the uh, uncodified emergency ordinance number 2020-24 under number 4.2, it says may be held through electronic means. So as you had stated, um, the boards and commissions are not mandated to offer the Zoom. However, it's good policy to allow it, um, if I'm understanding your advice properly. With having consistency, it would appear to me that instead of isolating the nominations committee, that this um, should be addressed with all boards and commissions. Because it, it almost seems like we're cherry picking um, what we're telling the nominations committee they have to do. Because if we were to pass this tonight, um, next week we could have another board or commission to decide to go, instead of having Zoom or hybrid, to go full in person. And then we're gonna be back here again, deciding whether or not we need another ordinance to address that particular board or commission. So with the consistency, should the nominations committee be taken out as far as the name of that committee taken out of this ordinance being considered tonight and simply have all boards and commissions? Mad Madam Mayor, um, if I might interject for a moment and suggest an approach um, that I think achieves um, what you're suggesting, um, keeping in mind that the framework of the entire ordinance as originally adopted was that this would be a permissive scheme and not a mandatory scheme. Exactly. And you're correct that what's in paragraph two of the ordinance this evening um, uh, changes that somewhat with regard to the nominations committee as it's presently drafted. It, it seems to me that uh, that consistency would be achieved if um, rather than referring to the nominations committee, we refer to any committee of city council. So the permissive nature of the ordinance would continue except in circumstances 
related to committees of council and for those committees, um, members of council who are not on any of those committees would be accommodated in their attendance of those committee meetings. And, but it still would leave um, you know, the EDA, the school board, the planning commission, exactly. the historic preservation commission to make decisions for themselves consistent with the existing ordinance about how they conduct their meetings. Okay, so, so we, we, I'm we sorry, could, go ahead. We could okay. bro broaden what's in paragraph two so that it applies not only to the nominations committee, but to any other committee of city council. And Madam. Oh, oh, I'm gonna follow up. So what you're stating is because the nominating committee consists of council members, that's why you would say, um, committees of council rather than boards and commissions. I'm trying to understand your explanation. Can well, you I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're trying to achieve by broadening it to address all boards and commissions because this is sort of a circumstance that's unique to city council as I understand it. Well, I mean, um, tomorrow we could have another board um, to decide to to go full in person and then we're going to be right back here if the council member wants to attend that particular board or commission's meeting through zoom we're going to be right back uh, at the same I, I don't the but the the provision that mr mcroberts is referring to that mandates that a council member be able to attend a meeting only applies to committees of city council, if I'm correct. Is that right, Mr. McRoberts? Yeah, the language, I mean, I think that's a good shorthand description. Uh, the language actually in the statute says committees, let me see, I'm, let me read it word for word. That's the safest way to go. Um, committee or subcommittee of council, um, created to perform the delegated functions of to or, or to advise council. That's word for word out of 2.2-3712G. Uh, okay. Cause that's, cause, because the, only those committees are the ones that have the mandate under FOIA to allow council members to participate, uh, to observe and, and, and attend. And so I think that's where this issue arises, it seems. Okay, but it's not mandated by law that, I mean, if, if they want to have in person, um, the nominating committee wants to have in person, they can. Um, but the recommendation is that um, it be allowed. Am, am I correct? That's, that's, that's my advice, yes ma'am. Okay, well, isn't that already in place? I mean, isn't, isn't it a matter of the nominating committee to make that decision, not the city council? If the nominating committee decides we will allow Zoom, then that is their choice. And that's given to them under 4.2 of the um, ordinance that was adopted back on March 24th. So to me, uh, the city council should not be voting on this. It should be the nominating committee that should make that decision. Matt, Madam Mayor, I think you can proceed how uh, a majority of count, council can proceed on this however it desires. Um, as staff, we've prepared the ordinance to address both of the issues that were raised during the council meeting on January 14th. And I appreciate that, but um, the thing is, we're getting down into the weeds and we're doing the job of the nominations committee for them. The yes, nominations sir. committee can make that decision. So what, what I was going, I just wanted to be sure that council members understand that um, the, the ordinance need not be adopted in the, in the form that it's presented. And right. if there are provisions of the ordinance that a majority of council um, chooses not to include um, in the adopted ordinance, that's certainly the prerogative of the majority. I just take issue with the um, full body of the city council directing the nominations committee on how to conduct their business when it's um, rightly given to them and they can make that decision on their own. Vice Mayor Robertson. No, that's, you 
made my point. <laughs> For one, one last point of clarification to both, to both uh, Mr. McRoberts and, and to Mr. Rosenberg. As far as the electronic portion, it's all pertinent from now until the expiration of the Uncodified Act only, correct? Yeah. Is that how I'm reading this or not? Except in some circumstances is what he said. Where you give an accommodation to someone who wants to come to a, uh, a, a job interview and, and is unable to get there. Is that true? I, I think I think that this issue may very well be less important, you know, upon the expiration of the emergency and the end of the pandemic, because uh, uh, at that point in time, uh, you know, there, there there's not the same kind of provision for Zoom access to people. But I would caution the uh, the council that that doesn't mean that the council uh, or a subcommittee uh, can't choose or committee can't choose to provide additional access by audio, visual, Zoom, however it wishes. What I'm saying is that it's certainly not required by the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, if it's provided, my recommendation is to provide it in an even-handed, non-discriminatory manner. And that's what I'm saying. Okay, that's good. That's clear. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Mr. Rosenberg, did you want to make any comments about the second part of this um, this item on the agenda as far as the, um, the Zoom and um, showing one's face? Um, during, <laughs> if they're participating in Zoom, whether it be in the regular meeting or closed meeting. Uh, um, I, I have no comment. Um, again, that was intended to reflect um, um, comments made from council members on January 14th, um, just to explain the provision, um, you know, it, it, it mandates, it would mandate the use of the video feature of uh, the Zoom platform um, with limited exceptions during the course of any particular meeting. Um, and uh, I think it's pretty straightforward in that regard. Okay, um, Mr. McRoberts, um, do you have any thoughts on, on that issue, any legal um, advice for us on whether or not um, we can mandate that someone show their face during an open meeting and or closed meeting if they're, if they're utilizing Zoom? Uh, I think that's the kind of thing that would be subject to a policy of council. Uh, seems like to me that uh, that governs council. I don't think you can force a member of the public to show their face. Uh, I think that that's a matter of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of association. Uh, however, uh, I certainly think the council can govern its members to behave in ways that the council wishes during meetings. And so if there is a desire for a sort of electronic meetings policy that addresses showing of the face, I think that's something within the purview of council. And Madam Mayor, just to elaborate a bit, I, I note that the ordinance as proposed um, applies to the members of city council or the members of any other public body that invokes the authority to use an electronic communications platform under the previously adopted ordinance. So members of the Planning Commission, members of the Historic Preservation Commission, um, members of the school board, members of the EDA, but not non-members um, under the ordinance as it's drafted would be required to utilize a video feature. And so that could be um, altered, um, just like you mentioned before, concerning um, the nominations committee being listed. Um, that could be altered as well as um, stating the public and, and all the different boards and commissions? Well, I don't think it needs to be. The way it's drafted presently, it provides for uh, exactly what I just recited. Okay. So it's very clear as it's drafted that it does not apply to the public. Does not apply. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you said it did apply. No, it applies only to members of city council or other public bodies that invoke the authority to meet on an electronic communications platform. 
Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood um, what you said. So does not apply. Okay, that makes Correct. a world of difference. All right, is there any further discussion or comments? This is Carolyn Dull. As council members should know, we've already received at least one, if not more, emails from committee chairs or board or commission chairs who are uh, appalled at this because they don't want to have to call out members because they're meeting totally virtually and their attendance is like 100% because, but not everyone has the bandwidth to have the video on and they're saying, what are you gonna do if they refuse to call out members if they're not visible at all times? I don't know that anybody bothered to respond to that. And of course I didn't because I think this, uh, this piece right here is uh, embarrassing. You know, we could take this whole thing out if Vice Mayor Robertson would like to apologize for making comments about my face in a meeting uh, and promise not to do it again. And if he does it again, that the mayor would promise to do her job and call him out of order. Uh, um, Council Member Dole, um, as Mr. Rosenberg just stated, uh, this would apply to uh, the city council members, not the commissions and boards. Am I correct in stating that? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, okay. it would apply to- Please see. give us a further explanation then. It, so let me just read it to you. It says that- I've, I've read it, but please explain it. Um, so there, it's, it's the, more member, the members of city council or the members of any other public body in the city that invoke the authority under the ordinance to meet on an electronic communications platform would be required to utilize the video feature of the platform. Okay, I'm going back to my first point when I said that that could be stricken and it could apply to simply the city council. Yeah, yes, it certainly could. Okay, that was my was, first point. Yes. And I was told I know that that was not um, allowable. No, certainly you could, you could make that change. Okay, just like we could, um, remove or edit the portion about the nominations committee. Correct. Okay. This is Carolyn Dahl. I would like to have language added that says that there will be no personal comments on physical features by one council member to another and that the mayor shall call them out and remove them from the meeting if they do that. And there's nothing unfair about that that's about as stupid as this uh, piece of uh, ordinance. All right, any additional comments or questions? Ma Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Roberts. Ms. Dahl, I I I'm not going to apologize, but I will tell you, simply the reason the comment was made is that while, and you've, you, You've done it more than once, Ms. Dull. You know, I would love to get along with you, but I'm simply, what the reason the comment was made is when you were talking and then I was trying, you made, you made a very, uh, just a gesture with your mouth and your face, just like, you know, you, that's what I was responding to. Carolyn, you've got a wonderful face. I have no problem with your face whatsoever. You must. You said stop smiling. I said stop smirking. Go back and listen to the tape. You said stop smiling. Okay, okay, fine. It depends on what you're, whether it's smirking or smiling, whatever the case. You know, I'm simply saying, you know, you were making just that, that little smile you get. And you know what I mean, Miss Me, Miss Thole? Mayor Oaks. Councilman Holmes. I swear to God, this is just ridiculous. We sound like Amen. A, we sound like a bunch of children. And I mean, it's just we've spent I don't know how much time on this. And this should have been something that was just simple, done. And and I, I just can't believe that one, you don't I think everybody, maybe, maybe everybody should apologize to everybody and then maybe we can move on and and do this. I, I think we should be able to use Zoom. I think, I, I just think it's crazy that you could, you 
not let somebody come to the nominating committee. You know, it's just, it's, it's just. They were, it's, no, point of order, they were letting her come just in person. The one now, I'm sorry. Just point of order, they were letting her come just in person. Right, right. But I'm just saying in Zoom, I mean, you know, right now with this, with, with the pandemic going on, I mean, it's, it's you never know when something, main, main reason I'm not there now is I don't feel that great. You know, and I, I'd have been, I would have been in council today, but I'm, I'm feeling a little rough today, and I just don't want to make nobody else sick. You know, and I know that a lot of these people are worried about their health. You know, and and it's just, it, it just seems really petty. I'm sorry, it just oh. seems very petty. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, we are past time. I am going to go ahead and close out the work session. We will be back at 7:30 for the regular meeting. The work session is now closed. As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and stream live, live on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. This meeting is also being recorded. I will ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oaks. Here. Ms. Darby. Here. Mr. Holmes. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Here. Ms. Dahl. Here. Ms. Mead. Here. I've confirmed all council members are present. All right. Thank you. I ask that City Manager Steve Rosenberg note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Madam Mayor, participating uh, on Zoom are Council Members Brenda Mead, Carolyn Dull, and Terry Holmes. I myself am participating on the Zoom platform as our Assistant City Manager Leslie Beauregard, Interim City Attorney Andrew McRoberts, Clerk of Council Faith Simmons, um, as well as James Corbett and Chris Tuttle with our Parks and Recreation Department. Thank you. Thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members of City Council. In addition to limited public seating in City Hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel in the city's website. During matters from the public on council's agenda towards the end of the meeting, public comments will be taken in person and by telephone. Members of the public who wish to participate in such matters by telephone at the appropriate time may call 844-854-2222. And when prompted, enter the access code 619-358 hashtag. Callers will be recognized in order. The public is reminded matters from the public is a time for council simply to listen to your comments. Each speaker will be limited to five minutes. Detailed instructions for public participation by telephone have been publicized over the course of the past week on the city's website and Facebook page and can be found now on the agenda for this meeting and on council's website at www.ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city dash council. Also, let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting, although being conducted in person, is also being conducted by Zoom with virtual participation of certain members of city council, given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID-19 outbreak, which is part of the total circumstances makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the City Code Ordinance 2020-04 regarding continuity of government, a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash COGORD 2020-04 as extended by City Council Ordinance Number 2021-04. I have to get a drink of water. Thank you. All right. At this time, the next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. I will ask everyone if you would care to, to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, the, the next item on the agenda is an invocation moment of silence. And tonight it is my turn. I um, will be doing a um, Chris, Christian invocation as allowed by the United States Supreme Court, but I will give my disclaimer. If you would like to participate in the invocation, please feel free. If you would not, um, you do not have to participate. First off, we have Valentine's coming up. And Valentine's is known as a holiday about love. So my invocation will be centered around love. First Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. If you'll please bow your heads, if you would care to. Dear God, this city council turns to you tonight and always seeking your guidance and wisdom. Please God, help us show the greatest expression of all, love to one another. Help us to keep our faith and hope strong for a bright future in Stanton. But mostly God, help us to simply show a kind act of love to our fellow person. Despite trials and tribulations, if we have love, we cannot fail because love conquers all. And all of us, in the end, truly love our beautiful city called Stanton, Virginia. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right. The next item is the mayor's report. All right. Today, I attended through Zoom the uh, COVID-19 emergency response um, discussions, and I believe Council Member Claffey also attended. Um, they continue to work to promote uh, the well being of our most needy within the community. Also, earlier this week, Council Member Carolyn Dole and myself, we attended the EFSP local board meeting. That's the Emergency Food and Service Program. Um, we were able to give out $136,682 in emergency relief. Um, also, I attended the CAPSOL meeting in which we continue to give out uh, the COVID relief grant money to um, different organizations in the area. Uh, and one in particular we focused on was the Arrow. Um, I also took a tour of the basement of Shelburne um, because Dr. Garrett Smith wanted to be able to show the council members, um, well, the clutter that's building up as far as the storage down in uh, the basement of Shelburne. I um, did this with council member Amy Darby, and I believe some other council members will be taking the tour uh, in the near future. So I've been busy. I'm sure other council members have been busy as well. So at this time, the next item is additional items by members of council. But before I do that, I do want to take a moment out to recognize um, the passing of uh, one of our um, council members, Bruce Elder. I, um, for years, sat next to Bruce Elder in the work sessions as well as the uh, regular meeting sessions. And the, his passing is truly a loss for the city of Stanton. He was the true definition of kind love. He loved everyone. And even if you did not agree with his politics, he was always respectful and kind and loving towards everyone. And so um, the passing of the past council member, Bruce Elder, is truly a loss for us all. Many prayers and many thoughts to his family. All right, with that, I'll um, entertain additional items by members of council. Mayor Oaks. Council member Holmes. Uh, yes, uh, since uh, you mentioned Bruce, I was, I was wondering if y'all would be interested in taking the little greenway right there in front of his 
shop and and maybe renaming it uh, like uh, Elder's Way or something like that. Just, you know, just that little grassy area that's in front of my place and his. I, I that think that great. would be that's wonderful. Um, there might be some regulations as far well, as... You'd have to vote on it, all of us, because you have to be dead for two years right. to name something after somebody. But if I was told that if we decided among ourselves that that was something we wanted to do, uh, we could change it. So uh, I'm just putting it out there because okay. I, think I like the all, idea, all Jerry. Us, all of us like Bruce. Oh yeah, and and uh, and, uh, and I think it would be a nice gesture to his family. Absolutely, he was a gentle soul. He was a great car guy. <laughs> and maybe we can have a card. <laughs> he would love that. Any additional items by other council members? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council Member Mead. Uh, this week I attended another update meeting of the Shenandoah, Central Shenandoah uh, Valley Planning District uh, Committee meeting uh, doing a food hub study. I, I'll remind you that we, that the district obtained a grant to do a feasibility study um, that, that, that has been in process for uh, most of uh, the uh, last half of 2020 and will continue for another couple of months. The uh, consulting firm that was hired was doing a feasibility study to determine uh, uh, the, the type of and location of a potential food hub in the community and have reached the conclusion that this food hub would include a secondary meat processing facility. So no, no butchering of live animals, but uh, a place where they might be cut up into smaller pieces and smoked or cured in other ways, uh, combined with a produce facility where produce could be accumulated from small local growers. Um, they would provide marketing and distribution support. Uh, the, the hub would include a commercial kitchen and classrooms so that uh, producers could uh, learn uh, how, to, how to market their products successfully. Um, the the uh, committee is now in the process of evaluating locations for this uh, food hub uh, and uh, will then move on with finding an operator and locating the food hub. And I'm working with um, Billy Vaughn uh, to evaluate locations within the city that might be appropriate for this hub and then propose them to the committee. Sounds good. Any um, additional comments by council members? This is Carolyn Dahl. Carolyn Dahl. Um, since our last council meeting, I've uh, attended the uh, Central Shenandoah Planning District Commission meeting by Zoom, uh, and also the SAW MPO meeting by Zoom, and the, of course, the, the, the emergency food and shelter board uh, met by Zoom that you attended as well. And also I did a, a TV show with, with a, a, someone named Robin Hoffman, who is an artist and a registered nurse. And um, maybe, maybe Leslie may have heard of her. She's, she's from Charlottesville and they do a TV show. And I think the name of it is A, a Day in a Minute or something, <laughs> something like that. Anyhow, met her at a great uh, protest uh, it, that uh, re revolved around the Atlantic Coast Pipeline back in 2017 uh, when they were trying to put the compressor station in that historically black uh, uh, community. And Reverend Barber was there and Al Gore was there and it was a great time and that's where we had met. So anyhow, she's got this, this uh, uh, TV show she does. So. That was kind of interesting. Um, and I would like to just say that um, I'm hoping that everyone is paying attention to the impeachment proceedings. And this is, um, these are days that will affect our country and its continued existence. And there's not much more important than what's going on right now. And I trust that people will, um, will wake up to what's really going on. We're so close to losing our country. Um, the, as more people are arrested and more uh, 
evidence is found. They're clearly white supremacists. They're, they're anti-Semitic. They're, they're all the worst elements of uh, humanity that have joined to keep Trump in office. So I am hoping that ultimately this country will do the right thing and save our democracy. Thanks. All right, moving on to the regular meeting. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Council Member Claffey. Madam Mayor, the uh, nominating committee met, met on uh, February the 2nd, 2021. We offer the following recommendations for persons to serve on boards and commissions. We would like to thank all of the uh, people that have applied for positions. We conducted eight or nine interviews that day and we, it was a great day and we really, we really appreciate all the support. We have a Stantonians who are willing to step up and help Stan be a better place. The reappointments I have at the Blue Ridge Criminal Justice Board to reappoint Susan Richardson to a two-year term beginning February 15, 2021 and expiring February 28th, 2023 for the library board to reappoint Randolph Burton to a four-year term beginning February 1st, 2021, expiring January 31st, 2025. For the Planning Commission to reappoint Joseph Mills to a four-year term beginning March 1st, 2021 and expiring February 28th, 2025. For the Recreational Advisory Commission to reappoint Michael Keats to a three-year term beginning December 1st, 2020 and expiring November 30th, 2023. For the Tourism Advisory Board to reappoint Sarah Lynch to a three-year term beginning November 1st, 2020 and expiring on October 31st, 2023. And Damon Strickland to a three-year term beginning March 1st, 2021 and expiring February 28th, 2024. Also for the Economic Development Authority to appoint Joseph Lee to fill the unexpired term of Wick the Lines beginning February 12th, 2021 and expiring January 31st, 2022 and to appoint William Cyrus to replace the expired term of Robert Baldigo for a four-year term beginning February 12th, 2021 and expiring January 31st, 2025. I move for council to appoint all persons listed. Okay, so we have a motion coming out of um, committee, so it does not need a second. Any further discussion? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council member Mead. I wonder, um, I, I believe that uh, Mr. Baldigo asked to be reappointed to the EDA. Is there a particular reason why he was not? We interviewed nine candidates that day, I believe, and, and feel like we chose the best candidates that were available. And, um, and I had a question for Mr. McRoberts related to a complaint uh, from a citizen who was one of those folks you interviewed who understood you to say that uh, in her, uh, in, in interviewing her for the EDA, that you were specifically looking for people who wanted to sell Stanton Crossing. And I wondered if Mr. McRoberts could respond as to whether that was appropriate or not. Uh, council member Mead, members of council, um, the nominating committee as I understand is set up to interview and to make a recommendation to council of the best candidate that they have found. Um, I don't see anything wrong with asking prospective nominees what their positions are on issues that might be facing the uh, committees to which they'd be appointed and bodies to which they'd be appointed. However, I would say that I'd be careful about that because uh, if you ask something of one candidate and you don't ask something of another candidate, for example, it might give rise to allegations of discrimination of various kinds. And certainly I would recommend that the kind of questions that you ask steer clear of prohibited categories like race, gender, health, uh, disability, those kinds of things. Okay, all right. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oak. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. 
Ms. Mead. No. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes, you're on mute. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dahl. No. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Now moving on to the regular meeting. Uh, the first item is A, the consent agenda. We have uh, A1, approval of meeting minutes, and A2, application for Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles Highway Safety Grant. All items will be voted on in one motion. If so requested by any member of council, an item placed on the consent agenda shall be removed and taken up as a separate matter. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Carolyn Dahl. Council Member Dahl. I would like item A2 uh, addressed separately and pulled from the consent agenda because we have a council memoranda that specifically says, uh, and the reason is for more transparency that we review every grant. And so if it's on the consent agenda, we're not reviewing it. Okay, uh, any further comments? Um, that's fine, that will be moved down and become item number D, excuse me, item E, item E. Uh, I will have to say that um, hopefully all the council members have reviewed uh, the different items listed under the consent agenda. Um, I believe the, uh, the action you're referring to council member uh, Dole was that we vote on every grant application that is presented to the uh, city. Um, and it is, it is part of the um, uh, regular meeting agenda and anyone can review it. However, this is Carol and Dole and uh, the reason it, it was because of transparency. So the fact that council members may or may not have read the grant doesn't provide that information and that discussion to the public. Transparency is for the public, not for the council. Well, again, it's um, part of the agenda attached to the regular meeting, which can be found on the city uh, website. Um, and again, it's a matter of voting on every grant was the reasoning for um, the action that you refer to. Mayor, Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council member Mead. Uh, I, my understanding is that a council member may remove an item from the consent agenda without any reason or without any explanation required. Is that your wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? I, I believe Carolyn Dahl asked for an item to be taken off the consent agenda, which is item A2, exactly. placed on the regular agenda. That, that is exactly what I just stated, that it now is item E. Great. And she does not require any, she's not required to make any explanation of her. No, I, no, no explanation required. However, I am allowed to give um, comments. All right. With that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with item A1. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item A2, which uh, and that item will then be moved to the end of the regular agenda for discussion and a separate vote. As item E. As item E, excuse me. Okay. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? A second, Ms. Terry Holmes. All right, council member Holmes is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dole. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item is item B, consideration of the proposed capital improvement plan FY 2021 through FY 2025. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Phil Trayer, the city's chief finance officer, will present this item. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be back this evening. Tonight, we are here to consider the FY2125 CIP plan. This year's five-year plan, both scheduled and unscheduled, equals $254,413,000 and was introduced 
at the January 14th, 2021 meeting, followed by a February 4th, 2021 specially called meeting and further reviewed this, e this evening during the work session. The school board appointed, approved the CIP on January 11th, 2021. The planning commission conducts a public hearing on January 21st, 2021, which was properly advertised and recommended approval of the plan afterwards. Schedule CIP equals 83 million 74,000. Breakout general fund 46 million 196,000. School fund 9 million 356,000. Water fund 19 million 805,000. Sewer fund 1 million 805,000. Stormwater fund 4 million 223,000. And parking 1 million 688,000. The city manager has reviewed this plan and recommends approval as presented. All right, any questions for Mr. Treyer? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. This is Carolyn Dole. Council Member Dole. I, I had a question about the uh, uh, the CIP that's uh, it's supposed to have, CIP items according to what's in the document are supposed to have a life of 10 or more years. Uh, but our staff said that golf carts uh, have to or only have a life of five to seven years. So is it appropriate for them to be in the CIP? I, Mr. Rosenberg, to whom shall that question be directed? Um, I, I'll hope that Mr. Trayer can respond to the question. Um, I believe that the uh, lifespan of the golf carts, although I believe um, Parks and Rec staff <clears throat> Uh, would, would prefer to um, uh, rotate carts within five years. Their, their current fleet is well in excess of five years. And I believe that these carts uh, will, will be in operations at Gypsy Hill Golf Course well in excess of five years, most likely 10 years plus, given the history of our utilization of golf carts. Okay, any additional questions or comments? All right, I'll entertain a motion. I don't have it. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I recommend that the city council adopt the capital improvement plan as presented. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Um, or council, I, I, I apologize. I, I need to. I, do you, I read do you the want wrong to, portion. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Vice Mayor like Robertson, to, and I'd if like you to, will reframe your. I'd like to re, uh, rephrase my uh, motion. I move that City Council adopt fiscal year 2021 2025 capital improvement plan totaling $254,413,439. Is there a second to this motion? Madam Mayor. Um, Council Member Clappy. I'm willing to second. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council Member Mead. I, I'd like to make a few comments. Um, first of all, I think we should remember that the city's responsibility to uh, citizens of, of Stanton is to provide core services sanitation, water, streets, including snow removal, which we probably are actively involved in at the moment, public libraries, schools, emergency services, transportation, um, and, and, and also uh, for everyone to keep in mind that one cent on our property tax uh, equals $205,000 of expenses. And, and as we saw earlier from the, um, uh, the uh, school board presentation, $200,000 equals a 1% raise for our teachers. And I'd also like to look at the um, capital improvement plan numbers on page four of the five-year plan, that of the identified $152,921 of uh, projects um, in, in the general fund, that uh, projects not scheduled and not funded total 70% of that number. Of the Stanton City Schools, of the 24,356,000 in 
projects scheduled, 62% are not scheduled and not funded. In the water fund, a core service that we are responsible for, of the 45,425,000 of projects uh, identified in, in that fund, only 56% are scheduled and are not funded are not scheduled and are not funded. In the sewer fund, another one of those core services that we must provide, of the $5,840,000 uh, of projects uh, over the next five years and beyond, 4,035,000 are not, are not scheduled and not funded. In the stormwater fund, and we all experience the effects of uh, flooding, in this past year of the 24 million in roughly uh, uh, projects that are identified, 83% are not scheduled and not funded. So the total number again of, of projects in the CIP plan, 254,413,439 dollars. 67% of that amount are projects that are not scheduled and not funded. I'd like to also point out that uh, again, the criteria for evaluating capital projects was major equipment having a useful life greater than 10 years. And we heard repeatedly from the staff and I appreciate Mr. Treyer's remarks and he's probably looking at it from an accounting perspective and the depreciable life of a golf cart uh, but golf carts useful life, as our staff has said multiple times, is five to seven years. So uh, I, I, and I also want to, I also want to read a few things uh, uh, that I, I found. There, there's a Facebook uh, page called Mutual Aid Infrastructure. It's a volunteer administered page. Uh, it's for the exchange of information for people who are seeking assistance with meeting the needs of their families and friends. And I'm just gonna read a couple of these for you and then ask you to tell, tell me, or at least tell yourself how $200,000 worth of golf carts is gonna help these people. Here's the first one. Looking for help for myself and daughter. We have been homeless since March, actually one day before the no evictions law came. We've been staying place to place, trying not to live in our truck, we have run out of places. I received SSI for disability and my daughter's in the process for SSI. She had three breaks in her back. There are now compressed discs and sleeping in a cold truck is too much on her. She's only 19, looking for a place to rent or even just a room. Please let me know if you know of anything. Thank you. Here's another one. Person looking for a microwave. My grandma has a severe liver disease and I can't afford a microwave for her because I'm paying hospital bills and stuff. <clears throat> Here's another one. Looking for firewood ASAP for a friend. She has five young children and in need of her only heating source at the moment. How about this one? Does anyone know of food banks open today? I'm trying to help my mom and son with some food before the snowstorm. Here's another one. If someone is COVID positive and family is quarantined, how can they get help with bills and rent? Another one. My, these are Stanton people. And I want you to tell me how $200,000 worth of golf carts is gonna make their life better. Looking for a friend. Need at least two bedrooms cheap, but not a shack. She's in need to get back on her feet. Message me if you know of anything. Okay, Council Member Mead, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I beg your pardon, but if you are going to interrupt me and stop me, you will need to, uh, to have a two-thirds majority vote. Uh, Councilwoman Mead, I, Point of order. I, I assume you were finished. So I am not finished. Okay, continue. I, wanted, I want to say further that it's amazing what a difference a year makes. On the 14th of May, 2020, the city council meeting when water and refuse fees increases were proposed. Consideration of an ordinance to increase water user fee 
the annual the annual cost for a family of four, $15.12. Mr. Treyer stated the additional funds would go towards major CIP projects, which are scheduled over the next four years, including the $6.9 million Gardner Spring Pump House project in fiscal year 2022 and phase one of the North River Pipeline replacement project of six and a half million in fiscal year 2024. Both projects are deemed critical for the city's water infrastructure. Ms. Oaks states, in good conscience during a pandemic crisis and economic hardship, I cannot vote to increase fees. Second, consideration of an ordinance to increase refuse fees. The annual cost for residential consumers, annual cost, $22.80. The rate increases go primarily towards retaining the recycling program and scheduled CIP projects, both at the Augusta Regional Landfill and to the city of Stanton. Ms. Oaks states she could not in good conscience during a pandemic crisis and economic hardship vote to increase fees. So I say that I cannot in good conscience during a pandemic crisis and economic hardship vote to buy $200,000 worth of golf carts that will not do anything for these people who are in real trouble. Thank you. Okay. So you are, you are finished. I do not- I am to... finished now, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, any additional comments? This is Carolyn Dahl. Council member Carolyn Dahl. You know, budgets, are really choices. But that's all you're doing. You're saying, here's the amount of money I've got, and this is how I want to spend it. And it's a matter of priorities. So so my my question is, do we want to put sidewalks on the majority of Montgomery Avenue, West Beverly, and Stewart Street, or do we want 44 golf carts? Or do we, do we want to have ADA compliant pedestrian signals on Coulter and Beverly Streets? Or do we want golf carts? Do we want Armstrong Avenue and Jiffy Mart and Gruber Avenue stormwater issue to be fixed? Or do we want golf carts? Because all of these could be done with that same amount of money or less. Do we want Tam Street in Westmoreland drainage system put in or do we want golf carts do we want new street at the beverly the storm drain problem fixed and that's only 40k or do we want golf carts do we want market street new street and augusta street to have a drainage system installed for 136.5 or do we want golf carts do we want Orchard Lane to have storm drains and Sheets and Blair Street to redirect their runoff and Marshall Road to prevent runoff? Those are all less than the golf carts. Do we want Mulberry Street Apartments to have multiple drop inlets put in and Elm Street to have inlets and Baylor Street and Woodley Road all for less than the cost of those golf carts? That's a choice that I'm not willing to make. We, we need to prioritize, and I don't think our city will benefit on the whole from those golf carts as compared to these real issues that Ms. Mead and I have both read to you. So I will be voting no, unless somebody wants to amend the CIP remove the golf carts, and then I support the rest of it. All right, any further comments? Um, I would like to say any citizens out there that are in need to contact the Salvation Army, the Valley Mission. Um, CAPSOL can be a guidance, Community Foundation can be a guidance, even Augusta Health can be a guidance. As far as voting um, in the past concerning fees to increase um, the cost of water usage. Um, water during a pandemic is very important. Um, wash your hands. Also, uh, utilities. Uh, water 
and utilities are vital, especially during a pandemic. Um, so with that clarification, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Council Member Holmes. I'm sorry, I just, uh, I, I agree with Brenda and Carolyn. I, right now, I'm not, a, I, I don't want the golf course to be shut down or anything like that. But at this time, do we have the money to spend there when we could be spending it on other things? I mean, you know, we're still in the middle of this pandemic and the golf course isn't going to go anywhere. We're not going to shut it down. You know, it just might be another year before it's like anything else. We put it off, you know, but I don't think that we should be buying 50 golf carts right now when we could spend that money on other things. I mean, you're going to have to trim up the, 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 the course anyway and do a lot of other work. I, I don't even know how much that'll cost, but that's on top of the carts. So I, I would just think that maybe we should put this off for the time being until we see how everything else goes. Well, hopefully the golf carts will help to be a revenue generator for the city. Well, it's kind of like building a field of dreams, you know, if you, you know, build it and they will come, but you don't know. I mean, we put the, we put the sprinkler system in, they didn't come, you know. Well, I mean, coming you know, now, you during know. the COVID. <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just, I just, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a, uh, a jerk about this I thing. Know, I just I think know, we, I, I think we should just really maybe take this down the road a little bit further okay. before we, we, uh, I, I'm not going to vote for for tonight, so um, I, I guess I, I agree with Brenda and Carolyn. Thank well, you. We have a motion on the floor, so I'll Miss um, Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey, aye. Ms. Mead, no. Mr. Holmes, no. Vice Mayor Robertson, aye. Ms. Dahl, no. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item C, a consideration of proposed FY 2022 holiday schedule. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, John Ben, our Chief Human Resources Officer will present this item. Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, as you are aware, the city stand observes 10 paid holidays annually, plus other holidays designated by city council. Uh, for FY22, we are recommending the 10 paid holidays listed in your briefing, plus adding Juneteenth, uh, in rec excuse me, adding June 20th in recognition of Juneteenth holiday for a total of 11 paid holidays for the FY22 holiday schedule. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council Member Mead. I move to adopt the fiscal 2022 holiday schedule with the addition of the observance of Juneteenth on Monday, June 20, 2022, as presented. Madam Mayor. We have a motion on the floor and we Madam have a second. A second. From Vice Mayor Robertson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Be safe. All right. The next item on the agenda is item D, an annual update on utility connection fees and facility fees. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Jeff Johnston, the city's public works director will present this item. Madam Mayor, members of council, in the words of the immortal Phil Schreyer, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, every year about this time, the public works director uh, provides an update to the council on uh, two uh, related but distinctly separate fees, the utility connection fee and the utility facility fees. Uh, this is my first time doing it. So I'm going to go into a, probably a little more detail than I need to. Uh, but uh, the, the two fees, the connection fee is the actual one-time cost of connecting a new service to either the water or the sewer system. Uh, it is very much a one-time sort of a now cost involved with that. Uh, 
the facility fees for water and, serve, and sewer are much more complex. Uh, they are a one-time fee to address a unknown impact. Uh, one individual service is not gonna require us to expand the water plant or expand the sewer plant, but collectively all that new service might. And this fee is designed to make sure that every new connection pays its fair share of that impact to the overall system, even though that impact may not really manifest itself until years later. Uh, so the first one is very much of a math problem. The second one is a little more of an essay question. Uh, so I'll start with the simple one, and that is the connection fees. Uh, the water fee is $2,100 per connection, uh, has not been, gone up since July of 2008. And looking at the actual costs, and there's a, a number of them here, uh, because it's a relatively small sample size. Um, in, the, in calendar year 2020, the average cost was a little more than 2,100. Uh, for the last 25 connections, uh, about a little bit, even just a tiny bit over 2,100. And across the last three years, a little bit below 2,100. So uh, the trend there is uh, on its way up, but there's really no reason to raise that fee now. However, uh, that fee is probably on the road to needing to be relooked at uh, maybe not next year, maybe the year after, but at some point. On the sewer side, uh, that fee is $3,100. And it was raised in two increments of 500 in both uh, fiscal year 20 and 21. Um, and you can see from the actuals, uh, it's very, very comfortably uh, aligned. I really don't see that number changing anytime soon. It's about where it needs to be. Uh, so really at this point, not recommending changing either of them but we're having much closer eye on the water number than we do the sewer number going forward. Then we get into the more complex issue of the facility fees. The facility fees are based on the size of the water connection. Uh, and they range, as you can see, dramatically from the thousands of dollars required for a single hookup, for a single household hookup, to hundreds of thousands of dollars for a large apartment complex or hotel. This number has been raised in July of 2006, July of 2011, and July of 2016. So counting on your fingers and toes, this would be a year when you would expect that we would probably want to raise it. Uh, and the reason that is, is that about every five years, uh, we enlist the help of a very uh, seasoned professional consultant to do the complex analysis of what our facility fees should be. Uh, it is a combination of both engineering investigation and economic investigation. Uh, and with those fresh results in hand, normally the public works director would be here uh, with the revised number. Mm -hmm. Now we had a new study in the 2021 budget mm -hmm. and were this a normal year, I would be waving that report uh, about and talking about some hard numbers. But because we sort of tiptoed into our budget this year, uh, we wanted to hold off on that study until we had a better feel. Uh, and now Phil has assured me that uh, it's safe to go ahead and execute that. We will get that new study. That study will inform this conversation next year. So uh, now I don't know. I, I mean, I can't stand here and say that you know, I'm going to ask you to raise fees just because it's time to raise fees. Um, but I would say that with some fresh numbers, uh, we'll have a more meaningful conversation about raising them or not raising them this time next year. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, not asking to raise the fees uh, right now, uh, probably going to have that conversation uh, this time next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council Member Mead. Um, uh, I don't see any, whereas you have information about uh, connection costs, in, in the uh, connection fee section. In the facility fee uh, area, you don't show any costs. Is there a reason for that? It's very, very difficult to articulate the costs because they don't always manifest themselves uh, right away. Uh, so that when we talk about facility fees, uh, it is a fair share contribution to something that might be in the CIP, uh, might not even be in the CIP yet. Uh, it's uh, sort of, uh, making sure that the folks who come late into our system are as vested as the people who have been paying their water bills for years and years and years. Um, and that's why, again, we, it's not the kind of thing where I can just look at actuals and compare them to, to the fees. We need that uh, uh, 
a facility fee study to look at uh, our CIP, uh, where things are and, and what other revenues are coming in and also what connections are coming off. Because uh, you know, uh, people come on our system, people also come off our system. Uh, so the capacity uh, changes aren't always linear. Um, so, I get that. Yeah, uh, just to be, just so I'm clear, uh, you might look at, for instance, projects that are coming up in, uh, in, in uh, the water fund and in the CIP for water uh, uh, projects and say, you know, we're going to have to adjust our facility fees in order to accommodate future water, water projects that we have in the plan? Yes, exactly. We'll look at recapitalization. We'll also look at expansion. Uh, if it looks like uh, we are nearing the point where additional treatment or storage or distribution capacity is required, uh, an additional tank or an additional treatment train, uh, that would factor into that as well. Thank you. All right, any additional comments or questions? Mayor Oaks. Council Member Holmes. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, are our fees pretty comparable to the surrounding area like Augusta County, Waynesboro? Our, our on paper fees are a little bit higher. Uh, in actuality, a lot of the uh, of our of our neighbors uh, are more prone to do actual cost connection fees. Uh, that's an option that we have as well in code, but we do not avail ourselves of it uh, that often. We uh, are, I think, maybe once or twice a year historically. If if there's a connection that we feel is going to be particularly expensive or particularly difficult. Uh, we have the option to require a deposit and then rec reconcile actual costs on the backside. Uh, we don't do that that often. Uh, other, uh, I know in the county and I believe in Waynesboro as well, they are much more, more prone to uh, doing an actual cost connection. So uh, the answer is uh, there's, our rates are a little high, um, but we are much more prone to you going fixed cost, which is a Real again, and certainly in the public works world, fixed costs are rare to come across. And I know certainly in the development world, they are as well. So there is some value in having that to be a known cost in, uh, in how we manage it. Thank you. All right, any additional questions? Thank you. We appreciate you presenting to us tonight. Ma'am. All right, the next item is item E which is the application for Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles Highway Safety Grant. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, this item uh, off of the consent agenda is now before you for discussion and consideration. And uh, Ms. Beauregard will present it to council. Great, thank you, uh, Mayor Oates and members of council. This is a, an application to a grant that's going to be made by the Stanton Police Department. Um, and this is a traffic and pedestrian safety grant that's provided annually through the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, these funds are allocated throughout the state. And in this case, the funds will allow the police department to increase the number of patrols dedicated to areas which have high collision rates. They look at the data um, to provide input on that. And in this case, it's in the form of overtime for those increased patrols. Um, the police department has been awarded this grant for the past two years and for the next funding cycle for um, federal fiscal year 2022, they'll be requesting $12,352. The grant application is due on February 28th of this, so later this month. There is no fiscal impact to the city accepting these grant funds because the grant match is all in kind. Um, attached is the grant application and I will try to answer any questions um, that you might have about this grant. Thank you. Any questions? I'm hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Robertson. Madam, Madam Mayor, yeah. I move that City Council authorize application for the National Highway Traffic Safety Grant from the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles in the amount of $12,352 to support traffic safety in the city of Stanton as proposed. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Uh, Mayor Oaks, uh, I second it. Ms. Terry Holmes. Thank you, Council Member Holmes. Any further discussion? I'm hearing none. Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. 
Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. All right, that takes us to matters from the city manager. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I have nothing for council this evening. All right, that takes us to the next item, which is matters from the public. I would like to read a statement, some remarks um, concerning matters from the public. This part of city council's agenda is entitled matters from the public. It is a time that council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a wide variety of subjects. Before we begin, I'd like to share five basic ground rules that we ask you to respect as you make your remarks. One, please come to the podium, identify yourself, and complete your remarks within five minutes. The mayor will let you know when you have reached your five minutes. So we ask that you uh, please give your name and your address and then keep your uh, minutes at five minutes or less. Two, this is a time for us as a council simply to listen to your remarks. In an effort to encourage and maintain orderly conduct, we will not engage in give and take debate. If you are seeking information, you may mention it during your remarks and the city manager or his staff may get in touch with you in the days ahead. Three, we ask that you direct your comments to council as a whole and not to identify members of council or to an ind individual employee of the city. If you wanna take up an issue with an individual member of council or an employee, please speak with us before or after the meeting. We are also accessible by phone, mail, or email. Again, we ask that you direct your comments to the council as a whole. Four, we expect every speaker to be civil and courteous using profanity, making personal attacks on an individual, and doing anything that is disruptive to the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be tolerated. Five, and finally, as the presiding officer, it is my duty to remind you that if you choose not to abide by these ground rules, I may find that you are out of order and will ask you to withdraw from the podium. We certainly do not want to reach that point and even beyond. So we respectfully ask for your full cooperation in observing these guidelines. So at, when you reach five minutes, I will let you know. If you continue to speak, I will ask you to step away from the podium. And a third time, I will ask you to please stop speaking and step away from the podium. Um, otherwise, you may be charged with disorderly conduct under Virginia Code Section 18.2-41.5. If you wish, you may obtain a copy of the ground rules from our Clerk of Council, Ms. Simmons. And now we welcome all speakers. The podium is now available, excuse me, for matters from the public. And again, welcome. I'm gonna accept um, members from the audience first because of the weather. So welcome, Dr. Kern. Uh, thank you, Mayor Oaks and uh, members of Council, good evening. And thank you so much for your recognition of uh, former Councilman Elder. Such a good man, such a good mind, such a good heart. He was a real peacemaker, and uh, he's irreplaceable. Yes. Um, I, I came here about a month ago, and I asked you all to pass a resolution about what happened in uh, Washington on January 6th, the terrible thing. And uh, since then, uh, nothing has happened. So I thought perhaps you wondered if it was just my idea for this resolution or perhaps if other people in town agreed. So I started a petition and uh, I collected so far 319 signatures of citizens of Stanton who support the resolution that I will again ask you tonight to pass. I'll give you the short version. I won't spend as much time as last time. And I, I'm not here because I uh, especially enjoy coming to city council meetings as a non-council member. I really feel obliged uh, as an American citizen uh, to, to address this issue. And I don't, I don't think this is a Republican or Democrat issue. I think it's just an issue of the rule of law and the preservation of our democracy. And so what I'm asking you for is to pass a resolution that would have three points. The first point I'm asking you to affirm that the November election was free, fair, and secure, and that Joe Biden was rightfully elected as the president of the United States. This one should be easy. 
uh, even the former President Trump's campaign uh, commissioner said that, quote, the November 3rd election was the most secure in American history. The Supreme Court refused to hear a challenge to the election. All the courts and all the local officials who dealt with the election said it was free and fair. So this is beyond <laughs> argument. Uh, number two, I am asking you to denounce the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th and call for Donald J. Trump to be held accountable for inciting violent insurrection. This attack was so dastardly. I went over last time some of the worst aspects of it, how attackers wanted to hang Vice President Pence. I think we've since seen footage of the Vice President being evacuated from the Capitol with his family, Senator Romney being evacuated very quickly. This was not just boys being boys. And this was not like what happened on the West Coast. This was not people in demonstrations breaking windows at a Starbucks in Fort. This was a mob incited by the President of the United States who attacked the Capitol of the United States while Congress was in session with the purpose of interrupting the certification of the presidential election. They were specifically trying to reverse the presidential election, which in a democracy is basically the end of democracy. So I'm asking you to, to come out for our democracy. Finally, I'm asking you to commit to protect our citizens in the future from potential unlawful activity of violent domestic terrorist groups. The Southern Poverty Law Center has identified more than 30 violent terrorist groups in the state of Virginia. I don't know if any of them are active in Stanton at this time. There's a, a cell in Harrisonburg. There are some groups that are active around the state, but waiting for them to get active is waiting for tragedy. When it comes to protecting our citizens against violence, prevention, an ounce of prevention is definitely worth a pound of care. So I would ask you to please commit our, to, to our citizens that you will protect us from such violent domestic terrorist groups. I'm asking you to release a statement to this effect. It won't cost anything. Uh, so, so it should be an easy decision. And it's not a national issue. This is an issue that has to do with everybody in America. Now city council has dealt with national issues before. You did decide to discuss the second amendment of the United States constitution. So you've set a precedent for dealing with national issues, but this is not a national issue. This is an issue for all Americans to stand up and defend our democracy. I ask you to release a statement in the spirit of President Lincoln, we, the people, are the rightful masters of both Congress and the courts not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who would pervert the Constitution. Thank you. Can Thank I you. submit my petition and my signature? Uh, yes, I Is will that, take it. Thank you. Okay? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Kern. Sure. I appreciate it. Thank you. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker. Welcome. Hi. Um, my name is James Mills. Uh, I live on uh, North Coulter Street here in Stanton. Um, and I just wanted to say that uh, I hope the council will make it a point uh, to utilize whatever revenues are brought in by the golf course to go towards helping those that are, are most in need in Stanton. And I understand the intention behind telling people about community resources that are seeking help from a, a Facebook group. But a homeless shelter at its very best is no place for a child. I ask that council members please choose their words better and consider the context of the conversation. For folks who are in those dire situations, whether or not uh, getting to golf carts is gonna be better for the city or not, that's not what they're thinking about. That's not their concern. They don't want to go to the homeless shelter. Um, so things are heated on the council, I, I hear that. And a lot of times the responses I'm hearing <clears throat> sound like they're more about scoring points um, against someone else. So I would just ask you, please always keep the residents of Stanton at the forefront of your mind. Um, especially those who are most in need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Great. Any additional speakers from the audience? All right. Hearing none, Mr. Rosenberg, will you allow the first caller through Zoom? Yes. 
Um, is the caller whose number ends in four seven on the line? Ball and Jennings, three three two Sharon Lane Stanton. I'd like to remind the council that the Gypsy Hill Park and the golf course is the main jewel of Stanton. It attracts a lot of people, a lot of business. The golf carts are needed, and it, the golf course is. 100 near 100 years old and it's maintained and upkeep is part of the park and it should be kept up and the golf parks are theirs to be used and let's, that's all part of the park and, and if we're going to attract the attention of this town, bring tourists in, bring business conference in, golf carts play a big part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. The caller whose number ends in 88 on the line. Is the caller whose number ends in 88 on the line? I think we had Let's a move to the next call, please. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends with eight one on the line? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. My name is Marnie Cheech. I live here in Stanton and Carsbrook Drive. I really wanted to thank the city council for all you do, you're doing in this most overwhelming and stressful year. But Madam Mayor, I want to apologize to you and to our three new council members on how you have been treated literally since day one, since the very night of the election. There is a small group here in Stanton that have made it their whole focus to attack you for on absolutely everything, and a lot of it is on absolutely nothing. It has gotten ridiculous with the things that they have come up with and made up, and it's almost comical if it were not for the fact that it's taking up entirely too much of our valuable time that is needed to deal with the real matters that are affecting our community. Stanton is tired of it. Every week there is me whining and crying about something different and it has gotten rid ridiculous and maddening. But I want you four to remember that the city of Stanton wanted you. We voted for you in May. The city of Stanton wanted change and we wanted you. We believe in you. So stay focused and stay focused on Stanton. We do not need to be talking about national issues during our city council. If we started talking about national issues, nothing would have been done all year. Remember the mission of the council is economic development and efficiency of government for, our, for Stanton. And our place is full right here in Stanton. That should be our focus and our main focus. So please look past all the smoke screen of all this selective outrage and division that that is being thrown at you constantly. Remember that the majority of Stanton is behind you. We might not yell and scream loud and we don't bully and threaten or write articles to the newspaper that only wants to make the vision here in Stanton. What we want is what's best for Stanton, and we chose you and your leadership to do that. Do not lose the faith. Know that you are supported, and you are supported by many. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 2-6 on the line? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. 
Hi, my name is Travis Smiley, and I live on Tivoli Lane in Stanton. Members of City Council, I speak to you tonight to thank you for your service to the City of Stanton and its citizens. The work you do is vital, and I appreciate your willingness to represent our interests as elected representatives. I cannot be prouder to see the good work being done under new leadership to make Stanton the most wonderful place in Virginia to live. Last May, according to the online database from the Virginia Department of Elections, the largest number of voters in the history of Stanton's local elections turned out to re-elect Mayor Oates and to elect Vice Mayor Robertson, as well as Council, Mayors, Council Members Darby and Classy. The Mayor and the Vice Mayor received the most and second most of votes of any member of Council has ever received, and Council Members Darby and Classy received the fourth and fifth highest total, total votes ever recorded in the first Stanton City Council election. The voters in Stanton made their voices heard because they felt their message was being ignored. We elected a new majority because we wanted responsible leadership who listens to its citizens, and I am thankful we now have just that. Since July 1st, at the reorganizational meeting, these meetings have been full of obstruction and vitriol for members whose brand of representation led to the election of a new majority. In spite of the nastiness and in spite of the obstruction, of those who cannot seem to accept the democratic will of the citizens of Stanton, our new leadership has admirably remained focused on the task at hand, which is conducting the business of the people of Stanton. I commend the four of you for all of that. Thankfully, we do not live in Washington, D.C. We do not task the member of the council to conduct national business. We task council with conducting the business of Stanton, Virginia, and it is not productive to continue to pester specific members to address national politics. Conservative activists did not filibuster council meetings demanding that members announce a violent riot surrounding the 2016 inauguration of former President Donald Trump. We did not obstruct meetings by demanding that members announce the incitement of violence from national figures like Speaker Pelosi, Majority Leader Schumer, or Representative Waters who directly encouraged the harassment of Trump supporters by saying things like, quote, create a crowd and push back on them. Tell them they're not welcome anymore, anywhere, end quote. And we did not threaten members for sharing the political meanings of the radical far left Bernie Sanders supporter who, at a Republican congressional baseball team practice, shot and nearly killed Representative Steve Scalise, Capitol Police Officer Crystal Griner, and a congressional aide in the lobbyist. So let's get back to the business of Stanton and stop suggesting this city council to double, to double standards. All seven members of city council deserve our respect because they have earned the right to represent us through democratic elections. We, the people of Stanton, elected these council members. We all try to live peacefully amongst one another as fellow citizens of Stanton. That is what makes up a community. It's time we let our elected leaders get to work on the common goal of making our city as great as it can be. We need to allocate funds for capital improvement plans like we just saw tonight to modernize our infrastructure and our shared facilities. We need friendlier tax rates to compete with our neighbors to attract new businesses, new jobs, and new residents in order for Stanton to grow and thrive. We need to come together as a people and let our elected officials work on our behalf. Thank you all for the work that you do, and I'm honored to speak here tonight. And I would use my time to call on the Stanton News Leader to be a fair press for the people and to represent both sides of the political spectrum. I do not have any control over what they do. They make editorial decisions on their own. But I would challenge them to live up to what we expect from a free and fair press, which is to equally represent each side of the political spectrum and not to ignore specifically one side's letters and opinions in their columns. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller his number ends in three seven on the line? Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Thank you. 
Mr. Plowman, let's move on to the next call, please. Is Why do we have an echo? Five, eight this, online? this is Carolyn Dole. Why are we having an echo on the system? Um, Kurt Plowman just threw his hands up. <laughs> he's, he's not sure. It's just a glitch. Is the, is the caller whose number ends in 58 on the line? Yes, I am. Please state your name, name and address. Petitioner. Yes, please proceed. This is Deborah Kushner at 1311 North Augusta Street. Ethics and budgets are two topics that should interest city councilors. Mayor Oaks hiring of her friend, 6th District Republican Chair Jennifer Brown for legal representation in the lawsuit that fellow council member Meade was forced to bring the mayor opted not to use the low-cost, the no-cost legal services available to her. So guess who is being asked to foot the unnecessary bill? Yes, taxpayers. In addition to refusing to address the January 6th insurrection, our mayor should address how much of her friend Jennifer Brown's ugly and inflammatory opinions of public citizens she shares. There is currently circulating on social media extremely unsavory examples of Jennifer Brown's opinions. Congratulations to Council Member Steve Claffey, the major advocate for what will be known as Golf Cart Gate, for a golf cart with 16 members in decline for more than a decade and in proximity to two other courses. That $200,000 could have provided for real and positive change in many city residents' futures for generations. This is a very, very dark day for Stanton. The Middle River Regional Jail is a huge shadow on our community. I call on city councilors to tour that jail. See for yourselves the deplorable conditions Talk to the people there awaiting trial because they don't have the bail funds to get out. Or better yet, urge the Department of Corrections to remove the people there under their jurisdiction so that overcrowding isn't a danger that it is. Instead of adding space, renovate the existing space to improve the plights of these human beings who may very well be there for no reason or for no reason, or whose lives could very well be changed by kindness in humanity rather than servitude. Why was Council Member Meade shut out of the nominations committee meeting, which should have been a mere courtesy? What is being hidden that took place in that meeting? Why was Council about Council Member Meade's request for attendance not sought from Council from City Attorney Doug Glenn weeks ago, but instead waited until tonight? well after that meeting. Transparency would be a welcome change in this administration. Citizen engagement needs to be welcomed rather than shunned as I was last week by Council Member Robertson. My presence provoked him to threaten me in an unkindly manner to record me. I don't mind that his bizarre tirade was directed at me I mind that Councilmember Robertson swore as an elected official to listen to me and represent me. Councilmember Robertson's disorderly conduct prompts me to recommend an intensive and immediate anger management course, and that he apologize to council members need and dull for his appallingly juvenile behavior. It's damaging to this community. Elected officials should bottle good behavior and ideals and be able to control their emotions. And last but not least, why are you meeting in person and not in quarantine after last Thursday's COVID exposure in council chambers? Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 6-3 on the line? Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, my name is Fritz Fairfield, and I live on Thorn Rose Avenue in Stanton. 
I have the biggest smile on my face this evening. I wish you folks could see the smile on my face in person. But, of course, if I were there with you, I would have on a mask that would hide my joy. So just let me explain. My smile tonight is because I was part of a petition effort in Stanton in 2018. We worked and talked and collected and waved banners and signs all over the city. Thousands of Stantonians and enthusiastic supporters signed our well-prepared words. But no one cared what we had to say. No one cared. Mr. Curran, your thoughtful presentation this evening just brings back a big smile to my face. Your efforts will not make a difference in decisions of this council. Members are elected to make the best decisions for the city. These decisions do not please everyone all of the time. And these decisions will forever pertain to only local government and local issues. Thank you, thank you for another delightful evening of listening to live City Council. And also, I'd like to say I'm so excited about the new golf carts that are coming to Gypsy Hill. I live not far away. I don't play golf, but it sounds like a nice outing to go down there and give it a try. I can drive it, and with it having a new cart and a new motor, maybe it'll be able to get me up the hill and I won't have to push it. Thank you so much for letting me speak this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 5-3 on the line? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Good evening. My name is Mark Jeter. I live on Sunnyside Street here in Stanton. Uh, sorry that I won't be uh, necessarily uh, as uh, prepared as I'd want to with uh, some of my remarks. It's going to be a bit more of a, a laundry list uh, than an easy recitation. Um, but uh, good evening to you, uh, uh, members of council and uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, a few things just to touch upon right quick. Um, I am glad that you all were elected. However, uh, just to point out, as an increase of only a few hundred from the most votes ever gotten compared to a 20 infold an increase in campaign spending for the city election, I don't think you really necessarily got the return for the, the dollar. Um, but going to uh, Eric Curran's desire that a resolution be passed by city council, that's something I'd like to reiterate. Um, June, January 6th is obviously something that is uh, scarred into our memories, and I think something coming from the local city council saying that's not something that we want in our city. We want to stop the hate from coming to our city. Just over the mountain Charlottesville in 2017, that happened where racist, white supremacist, and all manner of violent extremists landed in the city. Maybe we should do the same thing here. Maybe we should say that sort of action is not allowed, is not desired, is not wanted. That's what we're asking from you, City Council. It is a local issue. If you're willing to entertain an entire separate evening listening to Second Amendment thoughts, I think maybe a resolution condemning extremist violence against our capital and that we don't want those people here would also help. Considering we also saw members of the current City Council that were involved in promoting some of those ideas, I think it would be a nice m a message of unity to say that, that the danger of violence is not to exist here in Stanton. I also want to ask why we haven't uh, moved on Jasmine Brooks's uh, request uh, for that that has been for, for her uh, presentation, a request for response from the City Council for over six months since you've been in office now. I remember there was a uh, candidate, as well as council member, that happened in spring uh, of 2020 that said, yes, we'd look into an, uh, an executive officer that is an uh, um, equity um, officer for the city. Never happened. Um, so I don't know why we can't get back to Jasmine Brooks about that now. Also, with the committee, please be fair and open and trans, uh, uh, transparent with uh, uh, letting uh, other council members that have a right to watch. It's Zoom. Just turn on the computer and let them listen. It's not hard. 
Plus, you can see with certain council members not being able to wear a mask over their nose for the entire meeting, why a council member might feel unsafe within that room. It's been a year. People figure out how to wear a mask all the time. And it's not about consistency. Consistency can happen so that we have transparency across the board and all board and all committee meetings that city council members could attend. And lastly, I do not want to pay for a, uh, a counselor that someone had to employ because they couldn't get a document to a fellow council member and they didn't understand FOIA laws. If you have to get counsel to protect you and has to go and say why you didn't get a simple memo to a fellow council member and you made a mistake, pay it yourself. And that goes for every mistake that you make, that you make yourself, other council members. If you make a mistake, it's okay. You can say sorry and move on. Be adults. Be grown-ups. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 6-8 on the line? 40 South Jefferson Street. And I am going to keep it pretty short and simple tonight because the laundry list of grievances that I have with the majority of city council, it takes up way more than five minutes. But rest assured that we are providing um, transparency, accessibility uh, to our community members so that everyone can um, have oversight of what you're doing, both behind closed doors that you think you're pulling off, and, it, and right in front of us, egregious um, behaviors uh, that you continue to participate in. I uh, would like to address the mayor's um, statement about her rules of engagement for citizens to show up and speak to city council uh, and just uh, remind her that those rules of engagement are not appropriate um, because they come from a white supremacist model that tries to silence any type of oppositional voices. And since I do not have a seat of power in this community, the only thing I have is my voice. So I will continue to use it as I choose and invest in it. Uh, I'll just reiterate how absurd it is that we are um, investing taxpayer dollars, $200,000 in golf carts, when uh, data shows that um, a successful golf course relies on people spending their disposable income. And when I talk about people spending their disposable income, I mean people that make more than $95,000 a year. So I'm not for sure who in Stanton will be using their disposable income to ride those golf carts. And it sure as heck isn't going to be me and everybody else who lives on a fixed income or low income. So those golf carts do not serve me or anybody else in, in the uh, that population. Also, the golf cart um, course is dependent on a massive um, marketing campaign that includes word of mouth. I don't know how successful that's going to be um, because I haven't heard that great of things about the golf, golf course. So it's kind of like a failed venture to start with. We also know where that money came from. Uh, which had been a line item budget in the CIP plan that was meant to pay American Shakespeare Center for the transit hub property. So you took money from um, a project that would serve our low income population to buy golf carts for our most privileged citizens. And we see that. Uh, I would also like to say that I in no way, shape or form endorse the city um, making taxpayers pay for Mayor Oaks legal counsel, uh, especially since she is asking us to pay her friend and Republican political operative, Jennifer Brown, who charged $200 per hour for losing her FOIA case. It is my understanding that the mayor could have used free legal counsel through our partnership with the Virginia Municipal League and the Virginia Risk of Sharing, Sharing Association. So to ask taxpayers to pay uh, for a terrible choice that you made, which actually happens to be every choice that you make uh, is just upsetting. And um, that's pretty much all I'm gonna say tonight because everything I need to say to you is in your email box, which you never respond to. You do not call and talk to me about the issues at hand. 
I have not once received an email from Darby or Robertson or Clappy concerning legitimate issues. So I don't know how you expect me to engage with you in any real productive way when you are indeed not listening. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller on the line? Hello? Hello? Yes, please state your name Hello? and address. Can you hear? Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. My name is Barbara Lee and I live at 904 Rockway Street, Stanton, Virginia. And my comment is to Ms. Oaks. Mayor, I want to say this to you. It's good to know that you choose golf courts over human needs. When you pray tonight, please pray for those in need and not a golf course. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 88 on the line? Is the caller on the line? Okay. Hello? Yes, please state your name and address Hello. and put your comments to council. Yes, my name is Tim and I live in Stanton, Virginia. Um, I want to say the two people before the lady had just talked to Miss Oaks, the guy that says they want to put that equity officer in Stanton that's just putting into their hands. They want to defund the police department. The Miss Mead, Miss Dole, and Jasmine Brooks. They want to defund the police department. I'm gonna tell you what. My dad gave his life for the city of Stan for 32 years on that police force, and that's gonna be nothing but a slap in the face to him and every police officer that's on that force right now, and including the retired police force. That is wrong. Y'all wanted to fund the police department, so you want the city of Stan to look like Portland, Oregon, and Minnesota? Those two people, before, they, before that lady spoke to Miss Oaks, they are stupid. And also, what Travis Smiley said, yes, the Daily News leader, too, needs to be both ways in this issue to cover phone stories. They don't know how to tell the truth. They are a fake newspaper, just as by the bad tell fake lies as the daily news record in Harrisonburg and every news station in this area. And that includes CNN, MSNBC, and everything else. Joe Biden's got something over you in the media, newspaper people. Why don't y'all cover the truth? How much did he pay y'all not to cover anything about Hunter Biden and all his dealings? Everything's coming out in the wash. But I also want to say this. I agree. We do need those $2,000 $200, for those golf carts. That we do need. Also, I want to say one thing, and this is going to be directed. If Ms. Brooks, if you're there, listen to this. If you're a good person, as you say you are, why don't you get into school and help these black kids read? Give them a book. Because what's holding the black people back in this neighborhood, the black kids, are the Democrats, not the Republicans. All that stuff that happened in the White House and that insurrection, Trump didn't incite that. That was all Black Lives Matter and Antifa and the white supremacists. So I'm just telling you right now, that's what it is. Thank you. Goodbye. And yes, city council, y'all do a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in three seven on the line? Hello? 
Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Yeah, what number, what number you call? You're on, you're on, sir, please proceed. Yeah. Yes, this is the, yes, this is uh, Clarence Durrett, president of the Stanton Branch. At, uh, I live at 108 Ops Road uh, in Augusta County. And my, my, this Mr. Durrett, if you'll turn off your television or whatever you're using to stream the meeting, it will work better. Okay. All right. I'm just saying good evening, Council. <clears throat> this is the Stanton Branch, and we are wanting to know that we have sent out a letter to Andrew Oates, the mayor, that we want to have a conversation with her about things that went on um, in Washington and also the things that's been going around. And I understand there was a lot of mix up of the Martin Luther King speech. So we have reached out to you and we have not got no response. And now we are reaching out to you again and we are asking you to come and be with us so that we can sit down and talk about what is going on in Stanton and in, in, in about the Martin Luther King March. Thank you, I appreciate it. And we'd be looking forward to hearing from you one way or another. If you don't want to do it, send a letter to us and let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller on the line? Yes. Can you hear please, me? Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Julie Schofield and I live on Lake Avenue in Stanton, Virginia. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just reiterate some points that have been made earlier this evening. I strongly support the comments made in person by Eric Curran and want to state again my, uh, that I strongly support the city council making a statement about the events of January 6th. Um, I believe that speaking out against white supremacy, speaking out against anti-Semitism, speaking out against racism, those are local issues. And what we saw play out in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, we know that there are people in our midst right here in our community that share those views, that supported those actions. Some people were in attendance. And I think it's incredibly important that we consider these to be local issues. And I very much support uh, Eric Curran's petition and the points to be made. And what we'd really like to hear from the city council is pretty simple and straightforward. A couple of the people who spoke tonight talked about the validity of the city council election. And so I would say, you know, that's really what we're asking for. We're asking for the city council to really signal their support for the election of President Biden and Vice President Harris um, to validate it and to express that validation, just like we've heard speakers talk about validating the results of the local elections here in Stanton. And so, you know, I think it's rather hypocritical that, you know, we can support what happened here in Stanton, but we can't make a statement about uh, what happened in Washington in our national elections earlier, I mean, last year. So um, again, I really strongly support the sentiments expressed by Eric Kern earlier this evening. Um, I think it is a travesty that we're spending money on golf carts. I live very close to the park and walk in the park nearly every single day. Gypsy Hill Park is used so much by so many people for recreation. 
But the golf course is like a ghost town. You rarely see anybody playing up there at all. And so if we want to keep the golf course, which, you know, is a nice amenity for some people, privileged people, we really think it's a high priority to be spending that kind of money on golf courts when a more prudent, a more rational thing to do would be to replace one or two, replace them over time, and really spend our city taxpayer resources to meet human needs like those that were mentioned by uh, Councilmember Mead earlier. And then finally, I, I want to say that I really don't think that that city taxpayers should be paying the mayor's legal fees. Um, you know, if council would have been made available, if she had known the procedures, but, you know, she made a decision to go out and hire her own personal attorney, and therefore she should be responsible for paying for her own legal fees. And I think that's about it for tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller. Madam Mayor, there's one more caller on the line, and it appears that it's a caller who has already addressed council during matters from the public. And so I invite your instruction on how to handle that caller. Uh, no, sir. One caller, um, five minutes only, as well as uh, one speaker at the podium, five minutes only. Very good. So we will, we will disconnect that call. Thank you. There are no further calls. All right. Thank you. With that, I'll entertain a motion to go into closed meeting for one discussion of possible disposition of publicly held real property within the city and two consultation and discussion with legal counsel requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pertaining to a possible counsel action and procedure of counsel in its committees. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move that council enter a closed meeting for one discussion of possible disposition of publicly held real property within the city where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the public's body's bargaining position or negotiating strate uh, strategy pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A3 and two consultation and discussion with legal counsel requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pertaining to a possible counsel action and procedures of counsel and its committees pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A8. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Um, council Member Clappy. I will second that. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oates. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. We are now in closed session. Prove that council reconvene in an open meeting and certify to the best of each member's knowledge that only lawfully exempted public business matters were discussed and that only public business matters as identified in the closed meeting motion were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. Right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Council Member Claffey. I'd like to second that. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, we're back into an open session. And the first item the consideration of an uncodified emergency ordinance regarding additional conditions for use of electronic communications and meetings of city public bodies. I'll entertain a motion. Steve. <clears throat> city Manager Rosenberg, do you have some wording for us? Um, well, I think that, uh, I think if I can get some discussion from council about um, what your consensus is, I, I think I have some language to share with you. Okay, please proceed. Um, 
So if it is the case that council, bear with me for one second. Uh, there, were, there were two issues in the proposed ordinance. One addresses the um, mandated use of a video feature on an electronic communications platform. And the, address, the other addresses access to um, meetings of committees of, uh, meetings of the nominations committee of council by all members of council. So I understood from the prior discussion that perhaps there was a consensus that the first issue concerning use of video feature should be limited only to city council so that it does not mandate use of the video feature by other public bodies that invoke the authority to meet electronically. And if that is the sentiment of council, then you could replace, give me just a second here. You could replace lines 39 through 49. Of the draft ordinance. Hold on, hold on, hold on a second. second. I'm just trying to find that. Okay, replace what now? 39 through 49. 39 through 49 with, with the following language. And I'm just going to read it slowly as an additional condition of city council's use of any electronic communications platform that includes available video features, all members of council during city council meetings shall at all times activate and keep activated the available video feature of any electronic communications platform such as Zoom so that the council member is seen at all times during council's meetings, except during recesses of council and brief intermittent periods due to unanticipated technical difficulties or unexpected other circumstances. And if such conditions are not honored by a council member, the presiding officer shall caution the member twice during any meeting an absent compliance and yet a third instance of non-compliance shall direct that the meeting continue without the presence of the non-compliant member. So you would, you could adopt an ordinance that substitutes that language in place of lines 39 through 49. And the effect of that would be to limit the requirement only to council members participating in council meetings. Do you have any questions about that? Are there any questions? Uh, yes, yes, I'm gonna read it. So let, let, let's go back to uh, line 40. Uh, communication platform that includes available video features, all members of, please go on. Of council. Of, of council. During city council meetings. Gotcha shall at all times activate and keep activating the available video feature of the electronic communications platform such as Zoom, so that the council member is seen at all times during the public body's meeting? During, count, during council's meetings, seen at all times during council's meetings. All right. Except during recesses of council and brief intermittent periods due to unanticipated technical difficulties or unexpected other circumstances and if such conditions are not honored by a council, council member, member, the presiding officer shall caution the member twice during any meeting and absent compliance and yet a third instance of non-compliance shall direct that the meeting continue without the presence of the non-compliant member. Okay, I got that one. I think you could just make the motion, somebody could make the motion to 
adopt the ordinance with the changes to line 39 through 49 as suggested by the city manager. And then in the minutes, we can reflect in the adopted ordinance what I just read to you. I, I don't think, Mr. Claffey, that you necessarily need to read in the motion um, the, the change that I've just shared with you. I agree. This is Carolyn Dole. Carolyn Dole. Uh, I, I would much prefer that you put my name in there instead of council member because the whole intent of this is to try to, I don't know, humiliate me, uh, punish me, whatever. And so just put it in there uh, because clearly, I mean, that's the intention. There would be no other reason to have this stupid you know, paragraph in the ordinance except that you can't stand it. And I can't stand the vice mayor making comments about my appearance at all. And without being ever to told he's out of order and he and and no apology no let's let's i'm going to do better and not be rude and then we can all get along but in the absence of doing that i want my name in there hmm. okay any other comments mr rosenberg can you go over the second part uh, yes, Madam Mayor. So um, on that issue, um, I, I'm understanding that there may be a consensus to broaden the language um, concerning access by a council member to a meeting of a committee of council so that it's not only limited to um, meetings of the nominations committee. So on right. that item, um, the lines 51 through 56 could be replaced with um, the following language. 51 through 56 replaced with the following. Council members who are not members of a committee of council may observe such committee's meetings, including closed meetings, using an electronic communications platform. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, give me one second. Okay, let, let me start over. Um, I've got, I'm dealing with multiple screens here. I apologize. That's okay. Nice. Um, replace lines 51 through 56. With, uh, with the following. Council members who are not members of a committee of council may observe such committee's meetings including closed meetings using an electronic communications platform and such committee will facilitate such observation by a council member using an electronic communications platform with support to the extent necessary from city staff and the clerk of council. Okay. All right, let me re read this one back to you. Council members who are not members of a committee of council may observe such committee meetings, including closed meetings, using an electronic communications platform, and such committee will facilitate such observation by a council member using an electronic communication platform with support to the extent necessary from city staff and the clerk of council. Yeah, and and so I, the, the only, the only um, slight correction that I would suggest, Mr. Claffey, is that um, the word committee, where it appears for the second time, should be an apostrophe S, may observe such committees meetings. 
Vice Mayor Robertson would just, like to state. Steve, get, um, Mr. Rosenberg. Yes. And I maybe it's since it's part of this uncodified emergency, but I is it okay to say basically something that you knows this will be will carry on until until uh, council ends said uncodified emergency, or is um, it just because it's in there? It's okay. so it's. Um, Give me just a moment, Vice Mayor Robertson. I see um, that we also need to make some changes to lines um, 27 through 29, um, because there's specific reference to the nominations committee there. So that could be rewritten to say, to allow a council member who is not a member of a committee of council to observe such committee meetings, including closed meetings of such committee. Oh, said committee. I like the word such better, but whatever you want. There's also um, a reference on line 17. Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, remote attendance of city council members who desire to observe meetings of city council's committees, plural. Okay. And uh, I'm still, give me a moment, uh, Vice Mayor Robertson, to um, address your issue about the um, expiration. Yeah. Um, That's at line 37. It says the full ex extent permitted by law under these circumstances. We referenced circumstances that earlier. The um, Yeah, I would I would take the, the view and maybe Mr. McRoberts wants to share here that given the, the language in the recitals referring back to the continuity of government ordinance um as it's been extended that it's it's that it's understood that all of these provisions including the mandated video and the access to uh meetings of council committees are tied to the underlying continuity of government organ ordinance so that when it expires on april 9th if it's not extended these provisions uh to expire well, wouldn't that be taken care of in line 67? Can't we just put the 4-9 when the mayor signs it? You, you, you could do that. I would include that in your motion if that's what you wish to do. Yes. Okay, so how will that read? I'm just, just line 67 will now read 4-9. 2021. Okay. All right. Easy enough. Okay. All right. You want to do that? Please that bear part? with me. So, uh, Mr. Claffey, again, I mean, it's wh whatever you prefer, um, but I, I think you could very simply make a motion to um, adopt the ordinance with the um, amended in, in the manner suggested by the city manager. And all of my remarks are, you know, we've, we've got them recorded and the uh, ordinance as it will appear in the final minutes would reflect all of the changes that we discussed without the need for you to, you know, in detail go through every, every substitution that we've talked about. But if it's your preference to do that, by all means do so. Uh, I have a copy here and I, I, I would love just to wrap it up quickly. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. <laughs> Council Member Glappy. I propose that we accept the draft of 12121 with the corrections and additions as presented by our city manager, Steve Rosenberg, on lines 17, 28, 
3940 through 46. Also lines 51, 52, 53, and line 67 to be replaced with the expiration date of 4-9-2021. Aye. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I second that. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Any further discussion? Madam Mayor, I think we may have missed some line numbers with the motion. And we can amend the motion. Okay. So I, I saw uh, changes to... 51, 52, 53. No, back, back at the beginning. 28, 27. No, six, 17, se 17, 27, mm -hmm. 28, 29. Okay. 39 through, and I just said changes from 39 to 46. I thought there was a, uh, a range. Uh, 30, I would say 39. Yeah. Okay. 46, yep. And then line 67. Uh, mm. Did we get 51, 52, 53? Okay. And 67. Clear as Okay. All right. I second that amendment. Okay. So, any further discussion? Hold on. The only other thing I see is on starting on line 60, where you list uh, provide a copy to the chair of each yeah. public body. I don't think there's any harm in doing that, Ms. Darby. Um, you know, it, what you that the ordinance itself, um, you know, won't touch and concern um, those bodies the way that it's been revised, but as a, at really as the next in the series of ordinances concerning continuity of government, um, I think it makes sense to provide it to them and it does no harm in doing so. I agree. The only thing I was going to say too is, is you may want to add in the nominations committee meeting there to be consistent with all the other committees that are listed. I, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't think there's a need for that because we specifically, I mean, you're going to provide it to each member of city council and they are, they, they populate those committees. So you, you really cover the committees by providing a copy to each member of council. That's fine. And I, I would also just for the record, um, ask the maker and seconder of the motion to clarify that they, that, this is a motion to adopt the ordinance with these changes. Um, Councilmember so Clappy. Yes, I move that this, uh, <laughs> this ordinance be adopted with said amendment. I second that. Okay, so we have an amended motion and second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons. Yes, this is Carolyn right. Dahl. Carolyn Dahl. Uh, I would like to say I won't be supporting this because I I cannot believe the stupidity that's involved in these two items. One, you want to punish Brenda Mead instead of accommodating somebody in the midst of a pandemic to allow her to, to come in on Zoom. And, and we've gone through how many iterations of this. And then the other one is to punish me because I don't want to be harassed by Vice Mayor Robertson uh, about my facial appearance and it's stupid this is the dumbest thing i think i have ever been involved in in my life all right miss simmons will you please call the roll yeah, one question please uh, council member holmes sorry I, I was i was under the impression that actually uh somebody would be able to attend a meeting through zoom uh like the nominations committee and you're absolutely you're right. correct that is correct that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're passing okay all right miss simmons please call the roll Ms. mead aye mr claffey aye 
Ms. Dahl? No. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Ms. Darby? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, the next item is a discussion and consideration of possible city payment of judgment and attorney fees related to FOIA litigation. Alex, Madam Mayor. Um, Vice Mayor Robertson. <clears throat> I move the cancel as authorized by Virginia Code 15.2-1520. Find that the case number GV20-851 decided in the Stanton General District Court was brought against Mayor Andrea Oak by virtue of her actions in furtherance of her duties as a member of council in serving the city of Stanton. Second, read that we ratify the engagement of Jennifer L. Brown, Esquire, as counsel for Mayor Oaks in that case to the extent necessary to appropriate the sum below. Appropriate and authorized payment of the sum of $4,050 for fees and costs incurred by Mayor Oaks in defending that case to its conclusion and appropriate and authorize payment of the sum of $3,374.25 for the judgment <coughs> awarded against Mayor Oaks in that case, said monies to be taken from the general fund. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor, I'll second it. Council Member Claffey is second. Any further discussion? This is Carolyn Dahl. Carolyn Dahl. Carolyn Dahl. Uh, I think this is a misappropriation of taxpayers' dollars because uh, for, for various reasons, we did not in advance approve the expenditure of these funds. Uh, our own council memorandum says the mayor is limited to $250 without the council's prior approval. No one ever asked us for that. And there was plenty of time as, that, the, as the court case was delayed um, uh, at least one time, I can't remember. Um, and then in, in the uh, state statute 15.2-1520, that again says to ratify it. It doesn't say on the back end. And I argue that this is not really in the furtherance of your duties because what it really was, and I saw the very first email, Ms. Mead was asking for a copy of a resolution of an ordinance that we had to vote on without ever seeing. And the recording of that meeting on September 10th, it indicates and it's recorded that Vice Mayor Robertson, after reading it, says, and Mayor, here's the copy. It was very clear you had that document. You chose not to even give her the courtesy of responding to the email. So, you know, you didn't comply with our own memoranda. You're not complying with uh, the the uh, state statute, uh, and I'm totally opposed to the, this misappropriation of taxpayers' dollars because, and you've had FOIA training for how many years? It, you you came on council in 2008, and so you've had 12 years of FOIA training, and you and and even if you knew nothing about FOIA. As a courtesy, you would respond to an email from a council member. Any other comments? Mayor Oaks, this is Brenda Mead. Council member Mead. Um, I, I guess I would question whether uh, the mayor meets the criterion of having incurred the expenses in furtherance of her duties. Furtherance is the act of helping or advancement and, and uh, the mayor did not help or advance the uh, 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 any effort of the city in this case. She failed to perform her duties when she failed to provide the amended resolution to the clerk of council at the end of the meeting in September. She failed to answer any of the three emails that I sent requesting 
a copy of the amended document. She failed to respond that she had misplaced the document or offer any of the legal exemptions provided under FOIA. She declined mediation when offered by the judge in the first hearing on the matter, stating that her case was so strong she didn't need to mediate. She declined to use city council. Well, I'll skip that one. She hired an attorney who had no local government experience, no FOIA experience, came to court poorly prepared and charged 50% more than my attorney, a Richmond attorney who had to drive from Richmond and back in order to defend me. And in addition, on the first day she was elected mayor, she publicly endorsed her attorney for chairmanship of the sixth district Republican committee. I, I just think none of those things were in furtherance of her duties as mayor of the city of Stanton. Any further discussion? And I will abstain from this vote as I was, uh, as I mentioned to uh, Mr. McRoberts uh, in, in Virginia, it, it, it's a difference between what's legal and what's ethical. And, and in Virginia, uh, having an extramarital affair is not illegal, but it certainly is unethical. So there is a distinction between the two and I believe it would be unethical for me to participate in this vote. So I will not, I will abstain. All right. Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. No. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. No. Motion carries. All right. With that, we are now at adjournment. And as mayor of the city of Stanton, I now hereby this, um, declare this meeting closed.